I just want to take the opportunity um, for today just to set the scene a little bit. And I'd like to start um, outlining the scale of the challenge in Essex and where we are starting from. As many of you will know, the global surface temperature is more than one degree centigrade above pre-industrial uh, levels on a global basis. And it might not sound much, but it's already affecting us here in Essex. And the number of homes at risk to surface water flooding is, is expected to double between now and 2050. And the whole of Eastern England is now classified as seriously water stressed. And the climate change is leading to hotter, drier summers, and it's shrinking and cr cracking the ground under houses. And the British Geological Survey reports the risk of clay related subsidy increases, subsidence, sorry, uh, increases by about a third by 2030. And this means that potentially up to one million homes are at risk in the UK. Um, and in 1990, uh, that was in 1990, and it's set to rise to 2.4 million by 2030. And then that's an enormous increase of risk. And Essex is one of the few areas that may be affected by that. And of course, as I mentioned, the UK mean sea level has risen 16 centimetres from 1900 and is expected to rise by another 35 centimetres by 2050. But this would pose a serious threat to some of our coastal communities as well. So what are we doing at Essex? So last year, we worked with partners to set up the Essex Local Nature Partnership. We're delighted today that Simon Lister accepted the role as chair and the local partnership has really hit the ground running. And, our, and under Simon's chair, chairship, Simon is going to be chairing um, an expert panel a little bit later this morning. We also started work on the climate focus area, part of which was uh, to help set up the North Essex Farm Cluster with other partners. And that's the important thing. This is involving lots of other people. And Emma Gray, who's here today, um, is a cluster coordinator, and she's also on our panel uh, so that she can um, talk about her experiences and answer questions. We also help fund the extension of the beaver compound at Spain's Hall, providing increased flood protection for Finchley Field. And Archie Ruggles Bryce from Spain's Hall, uh, who's been quite well known for his beavers, um, and Finchley Field is also on our panel today. So lots of opportunity to ask uh, animal questions as well. So what have we done this year? Well, we continue to support the climate focus area including the creation of four business cases for creating nature across the four estates, which covers 438 hectares. Um, and I think in uh, those of you that still like acres, that is getting up towards 1,000 acres. And that is all through the Natural Environment Investment Readiness Fund. And we've also established a knowledge hub platform for the climate focus area community groups, following a consultation with over 30 local communities landowners and businesses. And we work with the Essex Wildlife Trust, the ISPB, the National Trust, the Essex and Suffolk Water County, uh, County to apply to the Blackwater and Clone Landscape Recovery Scheme, which covers 2,600 hectares and includes 33 land managers. And we have started work on two Essex County Council biodiversity net gain offsites which John Meehan, uh, the head of our climate and adaption and mitigation is here today. And he's gonna highlight later on what we are doing and now watching the first shoots of the biodiversity net gain meadows created on Mersey Island. And we've also been working in urban areas with the publishing of the Essex County Council tree plan in May and the initiation of the Essex Green Street Program, which assesses the health of our highways tree stock and identifies new tree planting opportunities in the highway. And we know how important that is for not only flood resistance, but also air quality and uh, sh shade as well. So we are also seeking 2.4 million funding from DEFA to plant 2,000 street and urban trees. We have also uh, planted 241,000 trees with our partners over the last three years. The Essex Forest Initiative is aiming to plant another 130,000 trees across the county this winter. And we've also completed the Essex Water Strategy, which is going to go out to partners for comments soon, and it's going to be finalised in early 2020 for next year. Finally, 
uh, we established our local na nature recovery strategy partnerships via the local na nature partnership and the 14 surrounding local authorities at Nessex. And we were complimented by DEFRA for being well prepared. So today we've got a group of real live Essex uh, speakers and practitioners talking about nature recovery, climate resilience, land use, change and biodiversity in net, net gain. And I am really looking forward to hear uh, what they've got to say about this. But we've also got um, two big hitters with us today from the climate change movement and the world of nature recovery, because we have got Lord Deben, Chair of the Climate Change Commission, and Tony Juniper, Chair of Natural England, and they're going to give us two keynote speeches. So that's pretty good for today. So I'm glad that you're all here to hear it, and it's going to be interesting for all. So without uh, too much, I just want to quickly introduce Lord Deben before he comes up. Uh, the Right Honourable Lord Gunnar, Lord Deben, is the founder and the chairman of Sandcroft International, a consultancy that advises both businesses and investors on all areas of sustainability. Between 2012 and 23, he was chair of the UK's Independent Climate Change Committee. Lord Deven was also the UK's longest serving Secretary of State for the Environment from 93 to 97, having previously been Minister of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food. That's a job that I would actually like myself. Throughout his political business and personal life, Lord Deven has consistently championed an accord between sustainability and business sense. So, Lord Deven, I invite you up here for uh, your half hour. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, and I'm very pleased to be here. Um, it's uh, a fascinating thing for me to look back, because had I been here in Essex 20 years ago, um, and had there been such an audience, uh, it would have been filled with people who didn't believe that climate change was happening. Um, and uh, 10 years ago, it would be filled with people who thought climate change might be happening, but they didn't need to do anything about it. And the change over that period of time has been enormous. And I want to say that because the truth is we sometimes get depressed about where we are. And I think it's very important occasionally to look back and see just how much has changed in recent years. Now, that doesn't mean to say we should in any way be complacent because we've got a tremendous amount to do. But we have to keep people's spirits up. Otherwise, they'll say, eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. We've actually got to show people that we can make the changes which are necessary. And I'm so pleased that you are concentrating on this particular occasion about climate change and nature. Um, and for me, that is best summed up actually by what quite a number of people, even those who have no religious connections with him, uh, think is one of the best pieces of work written on climate change, which was the Pope's encyclical Laudato Si. And in that, he had this concept, which is that climate change is the symptom of what we've done to the world. And that seems to me to be the best way of thinking of climate change. It's the world, the planet, trying out for, for healing. And, and therefore, it stops that division, which has so often been true, when people have talked about biodiversity or um, the fertility of the soil or pollution, as if these were separate things unconnected with each other. Um, and I think the hugely important change which has happened since in that last eight years, since the Pope's encyclical uh, was written, was that people really have caught on to this concept that what climate change is, is a symptom of all those things that we have done, the pollution of the sea and the air, the way in which we've reduced the fertility of our soil, the loss of biodiversity, and of course Britain is the country that has lost most biodiversity in, in the whole of Europe. And, and also it's about the way we've treated other people, because so much of what has been uh, gone wrong is the way that we haven't thought through how other people are going to be able to operate in the world in which we live. And so when we talk about nature, we should see it as central 
to the issue of climate change, but not on its own because so much of what we're talking about is interrelated and interconnected. And people who go on about climate change and forget about biodiversity need to be reminded that actually one of the areas which has most damaged us is the loss of biodiversity. And unless we get it back, we can't deal with climate change itself. So don't let's kid ourselves. This is not a pretty extra, a bit that's stuck on the end. It's actually very central to what we have to do. Now, if we're going to do it, it seems to me that we have to be very strict with ourselves. So I'm going to start off with falling out with the chairman because he kept on talking about planting trees. Doesn't matter how many trees you plant, it's how many trees are still living there 10 years later. There are a hell of a lot of trees that were planted and are dead. And I do think it's terribly important to talk about how we conserve all these things that we're doing. The Highways Agency has planted more trees than it's had hot dinners, and all that has happened is they've died because people have not looked after them. And so part of what we've got to learn again is actually the whole concept of caring for what we've got and what we improve. And we have to talk about it in those terms. Now, of course, I'm only teasing you. I'm sure you're looking after the trees extremely well. But I do think it's important when we're talking about it elsewhere, because otherwise people begin not to believe that we're serious. So let's think for a moment about that. Because nature has so often been thought as an add-on option, something that's just a bit, a bit twee, really, you know, one of those things that people who've got time about it think about. We haven't thought about it seriously enough, which is why I, I am very keen on being very careful about how we talk about planting, how we talk about nature areas, how we talk about even beavers. We do actually have to be serious about it because it is such a serious central issue of what, of what with which we are concerned. Now, it is, of course, important for climate change and nothing is as important materially as climate change. But one of the fascinating things is that all the science suggests, no, not suggests, actually says that a connection of human beings with nature is essential for health. That actually, even walking in a wood actually affects the body because we take in things in that way which we would never take in in any other way. So why I want us to be serious about it because of climate change, I also want us to be serious about it because there are far too many people who have too little connection with nature. Now, the government, um, in one of the curious uh, contradictions of this government, on the one hand makes silly jokes about not wanting the quarter of our city, but as if that's somehow awful, wonderful idea in my view, to be within a quarter of an hour of all the things that you really need seems to me to be sane. There is some kind of American uh, uh, conspiracy see, uh, system which unfortunately this government's caught hold of. But it has said that it wants everybody to be within a quarter of an hour of a green place. Now that's a, a good concept as long as the green places we're talking about are fulfilling the role that they should be fulfilling. We really have to accept, if we're being serious, we have to uh, accept that green spaces have very different qualities. Sometimes that's valuable because you want that difference, but very often it is that bits of green are really very sad, very sadly looked after. Uh, you know those roundabouts where people uh, have their notice saying looked after by somebody or other? My goodness, a number of those don't look as if they're looked after by anybody. It's the worst advertisement you can possibly have. But there is a lot that you can do with bits of green, and I'm not suggesting otherwise. But that is not where we really do have to concentrate. We have to create the kinds of environment in which our citizens, those who live in cities, have easy access. 
Now in Suffolk, where I come from, um, I come from flooded Debenham. Um, no, nobody has ever seen floods of the kind that we have had over the last fortnight. And even yesterday, after all that, I had to divert twice just to get into Ipswich from where we live, simply because the roads were impassable. And one just has to realise how serious that is and how serious it is, too, to all the things that we are doing uh, in terms of nature, because we have to live in a, an area of the country, which, as the chairman said, is not only uh, subject to flooding of the kind we've just seen, but it's also a semi-arid area. So we are short of water and we have too much of it. And of course, that's always very difficult to explain to people. I remember one of the sillier comments of a member of parliament who got up and said that he didn't think it was climate change was happening because it was snowing outside. Um, and uh, I had to intervene to explain to him the difference between weather and climate. But that was a sad situation. But <laughs> the, the, the fact of the matter is that, that uh, the, the serious fact is that in looking after nature, we have to recognise that we are making it more difficult for nature because of the climate change that we have already created. And that will go on getting worse and worse until at least the 2040s and the 2050s, because there's that amount of climate change in the system, frankly, largely created by Britain, because we invented the Industrial Revolution. So when you have those people who say, oh, well, it's only about that much in Britain, so you don't have to do anything here, you've got to get the Chinese to do it, you know. Just remind them that actually we've caused it and we have benefited from it and we are rich because of it. And that therefore we have a price to pay, which is to enable the world to recover from it. And we cannot avoid that serious challenge to us. But of course, looking after nature will mean that we have to change how we do it during this period of time because of the water and because of the drought. And also because we are seeing a change because of the heat in the, uh, in the wildlife that we have. Over dinner last night, we were just discussing the different birds that we see today from the ones that we saw 50 years ago. We were just discussing the plethora of green woodpeckers and the much fewer number of uh, flycatchers. We were talking about the differences which had taken place. And that is going to get more and more clear as, for example, many of the birds that used to fly south for the winter are staying here. It's not as bad as it is in the north of Scotland, where, pe where certain animals have got nowhere else to go. They've reached the edge of where they can uh, maintain their future. So we have to deal not only with nature as it is and as we have known it, we're having to deal with nature as it is being changed by the climate which is now altering. I, I don't much like the phrase climate change because I think it's a better word to say climate disruption. And we have to think about the fact that this is going to be much more disruptive. None of us knew that that flood was going to take place. Oh, they said there might be a lot of water, uh, low-lying areas might be affected. But in our village of Debenham, Water came to places water has never come to in the whole history. We know because we've got very detailed records, it really was unique. And the result of that was that um, there are people now who um, are um, sheltering elsewhere because their homes will be unusable for six months. And one of the lessons we learnt is how stupid we all are and I will give you the stupid action. Um, Short-sightedly, uh, people were encouraged not to use metal um, containers for their oil. They were told they should have plastic ones with a double skin, which you put them, and of course, 
They weren't fixed to anything, they were placed on bricks. So when the water came, they lifted those that were not entirely full up because they were far too light and they turned them over. And most of those houses are now not just flooded, but they are covered with oil because we hadn't thought, because we didn't care. Now that brings me to the nearest I shall come to politics. I think it is a scandal that governments dare to suggest that we should step back in the battle against climate change because we cannot stop. And, and that's why I'm going to say something very, uh, which you may think is rather rude, but there is a lady here who knows I've done it before. I always do this. Hands up those who have gone to see their Member of Parliament to talk about climate change during the last six months. Well, that's about average, four out of the lot of you. Now, everyone else ought to be ashamed because it's no point in being keen on these things unless you get the only people who can make the changes happen. And in Essex, you have a series of members of Parliament who need you in their surgeries every week. They must not go on talking as if climate change doesn't actually matter. Now, you've got some of some, the same political parties, you've got some who are serious about it. You've got others who are not. And I want to see you at those surgeries every week. Nobody should have a surgery without one person who goes and explains what's happening about climate change to Essex. That's why I think this is such an important meeting. You must take from this something to tell Pretty Patel about and you must do it with all the rest of them. And you've got some people who are clearly willing to stand for this, but a lot of others who are not. And not just the members of parliament. There are more people today who don't know how they are going to vote at the next election than at any time I can remember in all my political life. And that means that you need to make sure that you talk to the candidates of all the parties because this is going to be an election in which we have got to make climate change a central issue. It is more important for us, I've given up saying for our children, because even at my age, climate change is going to affect me. It flooded my village. Luckily, we were just above the flood, but my daughter in her house was literally that amount from being flooded, the only house in their little group which wasn't flooded. That is what the facts are about us. Leave alone our children, because this is what is happening with one degree over pre-industrial heat. And we are at the moment full on course for nearly three degrees. So anybody who thinks that we can put it off, anybody who talks about an easier way to reach net zero, when, if I may say so, all the independent evidence shows that the present plans will not get to net zero by 2050. That's what the Climate Change Committee has said. It has done the work. It is independent. That's what it is. It is quite wrong for the government to say it has an alternative, because it doesn't. And until we bring that home to every member of Parliament, and don't you think that just because you might change a government that it will be necessarily any better? I just remind you what happened when the Labour Party so rightly said they would not go on seeking and exploiting oil from the North Sea in the 2030s. The first two sets of people who attacked them were their two biggest donors, the GMB and Unite. So they would have just as much trouble trying to keep this on the road as the present government. And we have got to make it absolutely necessary for members of parliament to stand up for fighting what we have to fight for. It isn't a party political issue. It's something we have to convince everybody to see that it isn't 
just a thing to oh a thing to accept in a moderate kind of way oh yes i'm i just know a number of members of parliament who say of course i think climate change is very serious and I'm entirely in favour of net zero. It's just, it's just that we've got this problem with the wind farm and then there's the difficulty with the solar farm. And then, of course, we really don't want to upset people, so we really oughtn't to have any 20-mile uh, any limits. And, of course, you know, really, that we've got to do this in a way which doesn't in any way upset anyone. Frankly, you can't do it like that. What you've got to do is to find the things which really do make a difference and concentrate on those. All that you're doing for nature is absolutely essential. And the great advantage is that it does touch the hearts of very large numbers of people. But I want us to be more radical than that. And so I will just mention one or two other things. What on earth are we doing not taxing private aeroplanes so that the money goes to using, to doing things that we need to do to help people? I've got a very simple answer. You tax private aeroplanes for every flight because they are damaging to the environment and they should pay the full price. You use that money to take the VAT off the uh, uh, electricity when you plug your car in on the public system. It's quite wrong that I should be able to get VAT off mine because I happen to be lucky enough to have a drive. But if I put it in on the, when I'm in London, of course, I have to pay the VAT. Um, now, I was deeply opposed to leaving the European Union, and I still think it was one of the stupidest things we could have done. But having done it, we may as well use it. So why on earth not change the VAT rules, which we now can do without discussing with anyone else? All I'm asking for is a constant pressure on politicians to do the things that need to be done. And unless we do that, they won't do it because it has to be every member of parliament, every member of parliament standing up for what we need. So I want you to ask your members of parliament and candidates, are they committed to net zero in 2050? Are they committed to, to do everything they can if they're elected to meet our targets for 2030 and 2035? And unless they're prepared to stand up for that, you have to go on and on and on at them until they are prepared to stand for that. Because this ought to be every party accepting the future as far as we're concerned. So I'll end with what I want to say, uh, giving you some time for questions. I, I, I'd like to end just with one very simple uh, concept, which is to come back to Laudato Si. We have to hold this whole picture in our hands. It isn't either or, it's both and. As we get older, we learn that's very often true. People say, should you do this or that? It's very often you've got to do both of them. And that's what's true here. We have to do all those things for nature, but we have to do it in the context of doing all the things that we have to do to reach net zero by 2050. If we don't do that, then we are giving to ourselves, our children and our grandchildren an impossible world to live in. Uh, th thank you very much, Lord Deven. Uh, really thought provoking um, and you make some very good points um, and I'm sure everyone's uh, taken them in. Um, and just to reassure you, before I go to all the questions, uh, with regards to our tree strategy, uh, we've got a tree strategy for all of our trees and we do, we do look after them and keep them watered, so they are, that is really important. OK, so questions. The first one is, what will the recent changes to the government's net zero strategy mean in the long term path to net zero? What is the inside government understanding uh, directing the changes, anticipating a position down the line enabling us to achieve net zero by 2050? Well, the fact is, uh, the Climate Change Committee, since I was chairman, so done um, after the announcements, said that this will make it more difficult to reach net zero. We'd already said that the government's uh, plans were not satisfactory to reach net zero, uh, that we had less reliance on them than we had had uh, as they produced the details, um, and uh, this makes it worse. Uh, but secondly, we have to tell people that it also... Um, I think it's all right, because this, I, I think... 
my, you can hear me at the back, can you? Yes, good. Um, the, uh, the other thing is that, it, of course, it's going to be more expensive for everybody. See, this is the thing. If we don't have more renewable energy, we have to buy gas. And if you buy gas, that's more expensive. And people have to pay the bills. And so it is a nonsense. Similarly, with motor cars, um, the fact of the matter is that the price of uh, electric motor cars is falling very sharply. Um, by the time we get to 2030, it'll be much cheaper to run your electric motor car, particularly if the government's sensible enough to pass on the lower cost of electricity instead of, at the moment, keeping the price up because it's tied to the price of gas. That's not the sensible thing to do. By 2030, we won't be doing that. And therefore, there are a whole lot of people who would have been able to have or be, have much better chance of having uh, something which would be cheaper to run. So it's not just that it's going to make it more difficult to reach net zero. It is a cost to the public. The last time we did this was when we had the green crap bit from uh, David uh, Cameron. And uh, what happened then was that what they did then meant that we've built a million and a half houses which are not fit to the, for the future, all of which have got to be retrofitted. And the housing, the house builders are, should, be, should be ashamed of the scandal of taking the money, making a profit, and leaving the bill to the people who bought those houses. And the second thing that we've done is that your, all your bills are significantly higher because we step back on the expansion of, uh, of offshore wind and onshore wind. And after all, that's from a government which invented offshore wind. One has to say, if you really want to look at the big things that have been done, they've been done by the same government who's done the bad things. I mean, net zero, Mrs. Mrs. May, um, the uh, offshore wind was, uh, uh, was the, the government of the time. It was George Osborne who made that possible. So this is the problem. They think right for much of the time and then get pushed into doing the wrong thing. And this is the wrong thing. Okay, thank you. Um, next question. I'm glad to see that Slider is working, so it's coming up, which is great. At what point will Essex argue with central government that the increasing floodplain in the east of England is totally unsuitable for house building and that the rising sea level threatens to make new homes either uninsurable or the cost of insurance prohibitive? Well, I mean, I think this is absolutely sensible. We've actually got to be much more sensible. We've been building a lot of houses where we shouldn't have built them. Um, and uh, we must not go on doing it. And, and we've got to come to terms with it. We need to use all the brownfield sites that we have, and there are very many of them. We ought to have very much more release of that land. We should be building in the centres where people can, in fact, access things without having to have a motor car. We can change the world if we take it seriously. But the government has got to take it seriously, because if you leave it just to the house builders, what they like is a large space where they can put a lot of houses. And they're not terribly interested whether 10 years later they flood. So I would like to see house builders have to have an insurance system which keeps them involved in any large development they have for at least 20 years, because that should be a necessity for house building. Yeah, thank you. I suspect that question may have well come from somebody who's on a, a, one of the local planning authorities. <laughs> Um, the next question is, uh, Lord Deven, what can Essex do in terms of flood prevention? Again, another question about flood. Um, the roads have been very dangerous near where I live over the last week, and there's no, no indication of the area. But uh, as we've got 340 miles of uh, coast across Essex, uh, you know, there's an, every opportunity. Well, uh, first of all, I do think we have to recognise that it won't be easy to deal with this new world. And the cost of it is going to be very considerable. And it may well be that we are going to have to put up with inconvenience because the cost of protection uh, is going to be too great. Now, we've already seen that if you look at the way in which Britain handles snow. Uh, people complain and say, why don't we handle it as well as the Swedes? Well, the reason for it is that the Swedes get the snow every year and therefore they have to handle it in this way. If we get snow in, in 
increasingly, well, decreasingly uh, regularly, if we really tried to do what the Swedes did, it would be madness because we'd only use it once every 10 years. It would be very expensive. I honestly think we're going to have to be um, serious about not being able to make the changes which will protect us totally and concentrate on the things that really matter. In other words, protecting homes and the rest of it. I think there'll be times in which I will have to drive round and find my way. What I hope the Essex County Council and Suffolk too both well-run councils, as a matter of fact. In both cases, what I hope they'll do is to learn more effectively how to tell people about the problems. Because I think people will be willing to come to terms with them. What they don't like doing is driving down a road thinking they're going to be there, and then they get stopped. And then they don't know where they go. And I do think that the, the information is going to be the big way in which you keep people on side. Yeah, thank you. And I, I suppose that also uh, brings into the su sustainable ur urban drainage system because flooding is not just coastal, it can be anywhere. So actually that's important of design and planning in that process as well. Um, the next question is, uh, should we be fearful of international investment and ownership of our green energy projects or welcome their ability to financially enable it? Well, I'm all for as much international investment as possible. I do think we have to be very careful of certain um, countries which, um, uh, wh where we know they use this as part of their, um, uh, their, their overseas propaganda. Um, and of course, I'm not talking about China, but it does mean that we do have to be careful about some people. But in general, we want as much in um, investment in green st steps as we possibly can get, which is one of the reasons why I am frankly angry about the decisions of the government, because even though they are marginal, what they do is to signal to the world that we're not serious about it all, that when it comes to an election nearby, we'll do things which we shouldn't be doing. And, and that means that the investment is more likely to be put off. Mm -hmm. And I want to encourage that investment. And there is no doubt that we are now in an international competition for investment. Because after all, the United States has now got a system which is very attractive indeed, which is backing their policies. And who would have thought that 10 years ago? The European Union, without our help, sadly, the European Union is now advanced beyond us doing that. China announced last month the biggest investment in offshore wind, onshore wind and photovoltaics that has ever been made. And the result of that is that they will meet their targets more quickly than anyone thought. And what they're doing is weaponizing it. They are using that to produce the cheapest electric cars, to export the largest number of photovoltaic cells. What they've done is what we should have done, which is to turn the demands, the difficulties, into opportunities and money. There's the one way forward for our economy, and it's the green way forward, and we ought to get down there as quickly as possible. OK, and very quickly, and this must be the last question because of timing. Um, if we move eventually to... Oh, it's... Uh, sorry, yeah. If we move eventually to a ban on petrol cars, are the 15-minute cities irrelevant? Surely the point is to give people amenities locally so travel is unnecessary. I suspect another planner in the moon. Well, no, again, it's both and. The, the motor car is a remarkable thing that gives us great freedom. Um, what we've got to do is to have that freedom without it costing the earth. And that's what the move to electric vehicles gives us. But... We've also got to recover the nature of the city. And if you look at London, with its remarkable number of green spaces, they understood that you could live hugger-mugger, but you could live happily because there were the parks and the rest. And I'd much prefer to live, if I'm going to live in the town, I want to live where there are amenities within walking distance, that there's real greenness, and that the town has all the benefits of the city. City and civilization are very close together. We have created a world in which there's far too many people who get none of the advantages of the city 
because they live in suburbs which are a long way away. They have to use a car. They don't belong either in the country or the city. I'm a countryman, and that's where I most prefer to live. And therefore, I accept that I haven't got those immediacies, and I have to overcome that. If I live in a city, the quarter of an hour city is right and proper and what we should be working for. But people will want to go in a motor car, and the motor car that we need is the one that uses the least amount of the resources which we have got in this world. OK, thank you very much, Lord Deven, and thank you very much for uh, answering all those questions. OK, now we're going to uh, move on to our panel session um, of experts on nature, uh, all of whom are living and, and working in Essex. Um, and the, chat, the panel is going to be chaired by uh, Simon Lister, and I'm going to give you a brief synopsis of what he has done as well. So, of course, he's Essex-born, um, and he's the Dr Lister has worked in wildlife conservation most of his life. He's author of the textbook International Wildlife Law, and Simon has, uh, was head of the conservation policy at the World Wildlife Fund for nearly 10 years and was then Director General of the Wildlife Trust for further eight years. He's currently Chair of the Essex Local Nature Partnership and he sits on the Essex Climate Commission. So Simon, um, if you'd like to come up to stage for you and your panel. Thank you. That was a, a great sort of insight, I think, from Lord Deben into some of the sort of some of the challenges we've got, but also some of the solutions, which I think hopefully set a very useful context uh, for us. What we're going to focus on in this session is actually what's happening in Essex and what are we trying uh, to do about it in terms of uh, uh, tackling nature, um, in, in terms of reaching net zero, um, but also uh, producing food and doing some of the sort of basic things of life that, that we all need. Um, and we've got on the panel, as, uh, as Peter said, three sort of people who are absolutely at the sort of the coalface um, of trying to tackle these changes in Essex. And I was pleased to hear Lord Deben in his sort of state of the, na state of the world sort of uh, address saying that what you really have to do is focus on what you can do in the context you're living as well. And that's what we're trying to do in Essex. We're trying to get to net zero, we're trying to get to nature recovery, and we're trying to meet the other human needs at the same time. And what we're going to hear from our panel is what they're doing um, and, and how successful we're being in that. But just before we start with the panel, I've been asked to say a few words about the Local Nature Partnership and, uh, and about our Local Nature Recovery uh, Strategy. Um, and all this really goes back to the 2021 Environment Act, which put a duty on all public bodies, not just to conserve environment uh, uh, biodiversity, but for the first time ever to enhance it as well. So we no longer have a conservation agenda. We have a nature enhancement agenda and it's embedded in the law. And the Essex County Council, I think very sensibly, uh, who also as part of that act, uh, like every county, have to come up with a local nature recovery strategy for Essex. Other counties will do it obviously for their counties. Uh, set up this local nature partnership about 18 months ago uh, in order to help them come up with a local nature recovery strategy. Um, and there are just a couple of things about that local nature recovery strategy that I just wanted to sort of emphasize. The first thing is that as part, and again, this is embedded in the law, we have to uh, come up with a map of existing sites for nature. What we've got now that is, is good. Uh, we also have to more importantly, come up with an opportunity map that sets out where we think the best opportunities for nature recovery are in Essex. And we've been working hard as a local nature partnership for, for uh, some months now in, uh, in preparing that local nature recovery strategy. And as a draft, we start the consultation exercise actually in a few weeks time. And I'll say a little bit more about that later on today. Um, and then there will be a broader consultation exercise. And then we hope to have it finalized by, by next summer. And we really want input into what those opportunity maps should look like because they will set the focus for where we, we think the priorities for nature recovery are. And just briefly about the local nature partnership, I think it's very important to emphasize that we cover a very broad spectrum of life in Essex. So for example, on our board, we have uh, the planning officers represented on, on our board. 
We have the chair of the Essex Developers Forum on our board, who's representing house building and other developments uh, in, in the county. We also have farming interests represented on our board. Of course, we have the, the conservation NGOs represented on our board, but we also have local, local communities uh, re represented on our board because there's some very exciting stuff going on within local communities to help tackle climate change and, and to achieve nature recovery as well. Um, we have the Essex Cultural Diversity Project uh, on our board because we need to take all sectors, backgrounds of, of Essex life with us uh, on this journey and a great many others as well. We even have the voice of youth represented. So, th so the whole point is that we come up with a local nature recovery strategy that everybody can buy into. That's what we're trying to do. I mean, as Lord Deben said, you know, it's not, it's not either or, it's both and. Yes, we've got to deliver nature recovery. Yes, we've got to deliver net zero, but we're only going to do that if we can bring people with us. And that's our challenge. And that's what we're trying to do. And we think we can do it. And as an example of why we think we can do it, the local nature partnership not only has this job of coming up with a local nature recovery strategy, but we also agreed four targets as to what we're trying to do, because the strategy is going to tell us where we're going to do it and how we're going to do it. But as a partnership, we've agreed that what we're going to do is, or what we're trying to achieve is four things. And I was very pleased to hear Nord Deben represent, uh, talk about the health and well-being benefits of, of, of nature and accessibility. And, and he mentioned the 15 minute target. And one of our targets as a local nature partnership is to make sure everybody in Essex has access to natural green space, not green space, natural green space within 15 minutes of where they live. And we, we need to recognize that not everybody in Essex has that right now. And where they don't have it is largely in the more deprived parts of the county. So it's very important for us that we, we try and deliver and work on that target and make sure we've achieved it by 2030. That's our target. We also have another people target. And that's, that is all about getting one in four people in Essex doing something for wildlife. Why one in four? Because there's, a, there's, there's some evidence to suggest that once one in four people do anything, it will then become more mainstream and a social norm. Um, and we also feel as a partnership that actually everybody, you know, as, as Lord Deem talking about climate, you know, we can't say, you know, unless the Chinese do it, you know, nothing will happen. Therefore, there's no point we're, we're doing. It. We've all got to do it. And we feel as a, as a partnership board that every single person in this county can do something to help wildlife if they choose to do so. And, you know, that can be in their garden. It can be the way they shop. If they don't have a garden. It can be putting up a window box. It can be joining one of these local community groups that are doing fantastic practical stuff for nature and climate within the community. There's a whole range of things things that, that, that people could do. But then two of our targets are related to land. And one is, and I think a very important one, is that by 2030, we double the amount of natural green space that we have in Essex. Where at the moment, it's about 14% of Essex is natural green infrastructure. We want that to be 30% by 2030. We also have a target relating to farming. And that is that 50% of all farmland should be managed sustainably by 2030. Now, those are targets we didn't invent ourselves. They came from the Essex Climate Commission, who were looking only at net zero, but recognized, as Lord Deben was saying, that actually what we do for nature is key to getting to, to, to net zero. Now, also, I just want to emphasize that if we're going to get those targets, there is no way we're going to get anywhere near those targets unless we work with the farming community. More than 60% of Essex is farmland. So developing those strong links with the farming community and getting farmers themselves uh, to farm more sustainably, to leave more space for nature is going to be essential. Now, the good news is that there are more incentives now than there have ever been for farmers to farm in a more environmentally friendly way. And what we'll hear about from this panel, and I'll come on to the panel uh, now, is some sort of practical examples of what's happening. 
So we're going to start, I'm, just, I'm going to introduce them all, then I have to do it again. But we're going to start with Archie, who is, as Peter said, not only is sort of a bit of a local superstar for having reintroduced beavers into the, con into the county for the first time for 400 years, first person to do it, um, as a flood control mechanism uh, to, to help prevent flooding at Finching Field. But by having those beavers, he's also turned what was a quite narrow ditch into a really 100 metre wide, not, maybe not quite 100 metre, 50 metre wide, wet woodland, which is absolutely fantastic for biodiversity. But he's also, and perhaps more importantly, um, on the estate that he manages, trying to get regenerative farming going so that he's producing food, but he's doing it in a nature-friendly way and he's helping us get to net zero. So we're going to hear from him first. Then we're going to hear from Emma, who, as Peter said, um, not only is doing amazing things herself, but she has a farm just outside Braintree, not only being managed you know, sustainably, it's, an, it's, it's no ploughing, it's a no-till farm, uh, it's full of birds, um, and it's got amazing soil quality. Now, and, and, but, and more importantly still, Emma and her husband Joe are not only sort of managing this farm terrifically, um, but also they are the cluster coordinators. And one of the things we're trying to do is you'll, you'll gather if, from these opportunity maps as well, is that the problem with our wildlife in Essex is it's too fragmented, two little bits here and there. And what we've got to do is to get better connectivity and at better scale. And through the farmer clusters, which and Emma's leading one for, for, for North Essex, called the North Essex cluster, although it actually goes all the way from the upper pant, upper Blackwater, all the way down to where the Blackwater goes into the sea at Malden. Um, and working with farmers and landowners in that area to what can they do collaboratively to get those nature recovery networks so there's more connectivity and more scale. And, uh, and I just quick joke about Emma is, is that uh, she, she, she says that her husband, you know, most husbands send their, their wives photographs of their children or their dog or something like that. But Joe sends Emma photographs of his worm casts, saying, just look at this worm cast. And of course, as a result, they have, fan it's just an illustration, the fantastic soil quality that they have got because of the way they've been managing the farm for the last 10 years or more. And then, then we've got Joe, and Joe's another superstar because Joe uh, is chief exec of the Wilderness Foundation, which is a, is a UK-wide charity, but we're lucky enough to have based in Essex. And Joe really is going to the, the, the people part. And as was mentioned before, we don't have, you know, a big issue is the lack of connectivity between people and nature. And, and Joe, through the Wilderness Foundation, is giving lots of people, particularly young people, particularly those from deprived areas, the opportunity to connect with nature. And so we'll hear about, uh, about that from Joe. So quickly, Archie, sorry, that was too long. Apologies. Uh, you have the floor. I'm not quite sure how we're going to do this, but we'll try. Uh, right, OK. Can you, is this working? Is that, um, so yeah, thank you, Simon, and and thank you to uh, Councillor Swear and and um, Lord Deben for for really setting the scene so well. Um, what we're doing on the estate is supported by any number of the people in this room, and so the the theme of partnership and the theme of doing both and is so things that really ring home to me. So you know, I I grew up um, in Essex. I went away and worked. I worked for water companies. I've worked for the environmental NGO sector and then came back and started running the family firm, which just happens to be a, happens to be a farm. And one of the things that was, is always very frustrating is that you, you are expected to do little things and don't rock the boat too much. Don't, um, don't be too ambitious. Don't do things that, that everyone else isn't doing. And that's one of the things that it is very frustrating if you want to try to change the dynamic. So one of the things we're trying to do on the estate is everything. So we're trying to do a whole holistic land use change project linking water, but it's linking water in terms of flood and drought together. It is working with carbon sequestration. So we're looking at climate action. We're also looking at resilience. So a lot of the things we're doing is looking at how we can be more resilient as a business, both financially, environmentally, and socially, but also then looking how we can increase the resilience of our local area. So Simon mentioned the flood project and beavers is what people kind of know us for, but it really is just one small part of what we're doing. 
And the other parts are looking at how, how we shift into some of these sustainable farming systems that is supported by the Essex Climate Action Commission, but actually, more importantly, not to denigrate the Essex Climate Action Commission at all, is just a better way of farming. It is a better way of making sure that we can produce food, we can continue to produce calories, but we do so in a way that is more in balance. So a lot of what we've done, we're a, a multi-generational estate. We're lucky enough to have owned our land for over 250 years. And I have seen, and we can look back through our, um, our archives and see this kind of shift away from mixed approaches, from sort of small scale diversification into you know, super industrial, this, that, and the next thing. And we've done all the diversifications that everybody talks about. So, you know, we've done the tourism thing, we've done the weddings thing, we've done all of those other activities. But what it comes down to is that we're a land-based business. And most of Essex, as Simon says, there's over 60% of Essex, over 70% of the UK, the average land holding in the UK is about 84 hectares, about 250 odd acres. You know, so we need everybody to be doing a little bit of something. And this is where one of the things that we're trying to do is open up, test out ideas, be that place where people can come and see what it looks like. So if we're talking agroforestry, lovely word means a million different things to a million different people, a bit like biodiversity and nature-based solutions. So what we're doing is we've picked some of them, we've put them all together, we've tried, we're trying them out, we're establishing one of the biggest nut growing operations in the country. That's where our food is coming from. And then the flat bits of the land, which used to be producing commodity food, those are now going over more to producing clean water, flood resilience, carbon sequestration, and importantly, supporting the biodiversity, which then eats the things we don't want to eat our nuts. So it's all interlinked. It's all about um, how you approach this in a holistic way. And I think that's one of the challenges that I would throw back to the policymakers is make your policies talk to each other. Because if you're developing, for example, biodiversity net gain policy in isolation to agri-environment policy, in isolation to climate change policy, and flood policy is developed in isolation to water resource policy, so the kind of drought piece as well, it all comes together on a piece of land. This is where it gets real. And if it can't fit together nicely, if those policies can't play together nicely on one patch of land, you've got it wrong. You've got something wrong and it needs to change. So one of these things I would urge everybody in the room, and I know there's a lot of influential people in the room here, is that the opportunity is massive. The opportunity for the rural sector is massive. The opportunity for Essex is astronomic. We are so well placed to be leaders of this. We don't, I think, have the opportunity to wait for central government leadership anymore. We need to just get on, do it, make it work locally, and then show them how to do it. So over my career, the last 20, 25 years, I've seen that if you show people that it can be done, then the policy tends to follow success. Let's make it successful. Let's make it successful in East Anglia. Let's make our rural business the exemplars, and that can then support those communities, both the, the larger communities we've got, but also the smaller rural communities where connectivity is a real challenge, where opportunity is a real challenge. Let's make the businesses so successful that people don't have to leave the rural area. They don't have to migrate into London to go and get the good jobs. They can sit around, they can work in the area in a way that is suitably um, technically advanced, but also satisfying and gives them access to that green space. So really, that's what we're trying to do. And one of the things that we're really proud to do is be working both with Emma and the North Essex Farm Cluster and with Joe and the Wilderness Foundation to try and fill in those knowledge gaps and that experience and um, reach gap that we've got as an individual business. We have to be realistic about what we can do and we have to try and help others follow the path and pick up the bits of what we're doing that are suitable for them, because it's also about choice. We can't tell people what to do. We need to give them the tools to make those decisions for themselves. Their puzzle is gonna look different to my puzzle, but all of the pieces need to be in place for them to pick it up and put that picture together. Okay. Thanks, Archie. Now we're gonna move on and then we'll do the, the question and answer session. Um, Emma, how's the cluster going? Are you making progress, are you? 
We are. Thank you. So thanks, Archie. So my name is Emma Gray. And my husband, Joe, and I farm, uh, as Simon mentioned, just outside uh, Braintree to the north of Braintree. Um, like Archie, um, our family has a connection uh, to the area that we farm in um, that dates back several hundred years. Um, but our current farm business um, uh, that is run by my husband, Joe, and I actually tenant the land. So we're in a slightly different situation. We're trying to do nature based stuff, but within the context of renting the land that we farm. So it's slightly different sort of structure to our business. Um, but since we took on the farm company um, 12 years ago, we've just been always very interested in how we can manage the land better in terms of biodiversity, in terms of making spaces for nature. Um, out of that interest and, and what we've begun to do on our own farm, um, the, the farm cluster was a natural next step for us. Uh, we felt very uh, strongly that we wanted the farm cluster to be farmer led. So farm clusters are not a new concept. Um, but we haven't really had them in Essex outside of the Stour Valley. Um, but if you look around the country, they're well established. Some of them are going sort of eight, ten years now. Uh, and the purpose of a farm cluster is really to bring together farmers and landowners across the landscape, working together on nature based stuff. Um, what that looks like in reality um, varies hugely across the country. But our farm cluster, which was uh, begun about a year ago, just about a year ago now, we felt that getting in a, a relatively late stage, actually, in terms of farm clusters, we wanted to be about helping farmers to recognise opportunities in nature markets and helping them to access those op opportunities outside of the traditional model. So a kind of blended approach. Farmers are pretty used to working with stewardship schemes on their land. They're well established. Um, and lots and lots of farms in Essex have already got those kind of stewardship agreements in place. Um, but actually, as we move forward, we're looking to bring a more blended approach. So looking at income for farmers, for nature-based stuff that comes from perhaps the private sector. Um, this is a kind of new thing that farmers haven't had much experience on. Um, and actually, when we're sort of setting a model out for, for our own farm cluster, as Archie said, in some ways, it's a case of getting together a group of farmers that want to work together and going for it and trying to find a way of making it work. The proof is in the, in the pudding, as it were. Um, not, there's not necessarily a blueprint to follow, but it felt the right direction for our farm cluster to go in. So our farm cluster, as Simon said, stretches sort of from the, the source of the pants, sort of Wimbish, Saffron Ward and that area of Essex. The river plant, pant flows to Braintree and Bocking, at which point it turns into the Blackwater. And obviously that flows out uh, via Malden. So it's actually a huge patch. It's quite ambitious patch to work in as a farm cluster. Uh, different challenges along the catchment. Uh, the catchment itself is something like 56,000 hectares. So it's, it's huge. It's huge. Um, and across that, we've got over 300 different farm holdings. So it's quite a, a, a big project. Um, the purpose sort of, our far, of our farm cluster over the past year is A, to be kind of identify and build a network of farmers and a network of farmers that are interested in working together on nature based stuff and or accessing uh, private sector markets for the nature that they can support on their farm. And also farmers that are, have got one eye on net zero and are looking at the sustainability model of their own business. Um, the way we're doing that is through a couple of different strands really. Um, we have events for our farmers throughout the year. Um, so to give you an example of, of some of the, the ones we did, we had a, a water resources day back in March and there are a few people here that I know came along and supported and took part in that. So that was all around. It was a, a day long event for farmers. Our, farm, our events are free for farm cluster members to, to come along to. And that was looking at some of the forecasting and predictions around water on farms over the the coming years and really looking at resilience and how farms can look to a build resilience within their farm business, preparing to farm in a situation where water scarcity is an absolute reality. But also looking at where are the opportunities for farmers to help with that picture. And as, as uh, Archie alluded to, things like holding water in the landscape, how can farmers manage the land in such a way is that when we do get huge deluges of water, we can hold that in the farmed landscape, which contributes to a more sustainable system by the point that that water hits the river. 
Um, so we had a sort of water resources day. We do sort of technical days for farmers. We've, we've just done a, a day this past weekend, which is all about pond restoration on farms. So we know ponds are, are good on farms. We know there's an appetite, particularly amongst farmers in our farm cluster, to create ponds and restore ponds in their landscape. Um, so, but where we might need to support is perhaps around some of the skills. So we had a sort of technical day where farmers were able to come along and listen to a range of experts talking about pond restoration in the farm landscape, see some demonstration of farms being restored on a farm, um, and just go away with those kind of ideas. And the, the other important thing for those farms is they can also access information on funding available to support some of this project work on their farm. Um, as we head into the second year of our farm cluster, we have a pilot project, um, our first sort of boots on the ground project that the farm cluster is doing. And that is connecting a group of 10 farms, all of which have river frontage on the pant. So we've got farms going from Bocking to Weathersfield on that stretch of the river pant. Um, and those farms are all coming together to do a connected nature project across that part of the landscape. So each farm has its own kind of ideas. We've been out as a farm cluster, my husband Joe and I as the coordinator have been to visit those farms and said, look, what is it that in your farm that you, you'd like to see that you've got capacity to do? Um, and for some farms that might feel like quite a small thing. It might be a small area of tree planting. It might be, and this is something that we're particularly passionate about, some hedgerow restoration, because hedges are a fantastic resource on farms that are often neglected. And a well-managed hedge is fantastic for biodiversity. So it might be for some farms, it's just some, a restoration of a hedgerow. But by being part of something bigger and making sure that where that intervention is placed in the farm makes sense in terms of what the neighbouring farms are doing, it adds huge value to what might otherwise be a relatively modest intervention on that particular farm. So our River Pant project is working on that. And as part of that, there's 30 uh, ponds being created or restored across the 10 farms. We've got about uh, four kilometres of hedgerow that are being enhanced as part of that. Two areas of agroforestry um, being created. And actually those agroforestry is slightly different from what Archie's doing um, because we're looking at uh, pasture uh, underneath uh, the trees that are planted there. And then that will be grazed in a sustainable way. So uh, looking at uh, meat production in terms of agroforestry. Um, there's also some wildlife corridor creation for that, connecting key sites. So we've got a, a triple SI woodland as part of the project. Um, and within sort of touching distance that that woodland, woodland is Gosfield wood, a large wood that has good value uh, in terms of biodiversity, but we could see an opportunity to link to large areas of woodland as part of the project. So that's gonna be another element. Um, so really the farm cluster is about spotting those opportunities on farms. We know that farmers are passionate about the landscape that they look after. They want to see it sustainably managed. They want to see biodiversity flourish within their farms. Uh, I've yet to meet a, meet a farmer that doesn't. You know, they, farmers that want to leave a legacy in the landscape and a really positive one. And what the farm cluster can do is reach out to those farmers and make what they're doing on individual farms have much greater impact by virtue of connecting it with their neighbours. Thank, thanks, Emma. And as you can tell, Emma is doing such a brilliant job coordinating and leading this, this cluster. And there are actually two others that are going in Essex as well. Um, so that's a very important part of, of, of what we see as the future. Jo. So um, thank you very much for being here. And actually, starting as a climate change commissioner all those years ago, um, it's been lovely to see people in the flesh today. So it just shows how remote we've all been working for so long. But what, what progress and how incredible that is because it's come with extraordinarily big, big brains, big hearts and extraordinary hard work. Um, the Wilderness Foundation um, is actually based on a very large farm just outside of Chatham Green. We're on a 400 acre farm of which we, we, we use about 44 acres for environmental education and therapeutic services and a wonderful small woodland up at Great Lees of 100 acres. And really lucky to work with Archie on our education team, helping him with his beaver education and building an education project. So what are we? Why, why do we do this? Why are we called the Wilderness Foundation? We're an organization that really started up to look at how do we protect wild spaces. Started in South Africa with true wilderness and in England where we were based to start with, there wasn't wilderness, but there was green land that had a wild, a wild element to it. 
where nature was actually able to be more self-determining, but not much of it. And the charity has become particularly passionate about how do we communicate this value of wild landscape to people? Because at the end of the day, there are too many of us, but we're the ones who are going to be the determinants of what actually happens to those wild spaces. And what we learn around the connection to nature is that if there is no sense of meaning for people in protecting wild nature, they're not going to do it. We have to find the elements that will actually drive people into a greater vision of their own relationship to the natural world so that it means something to them and they wish to protect it and be part of it. So we, we really started to look as our main thrust within the organization around the value of if we can actually see a benefit of nature for us and we can teach people to put a kind of care and protectionist value set back into nature. That sort of became a, a sort of virtuous cycle of the Wilderness Foundation. We are reaching over 8,000 people a year just in our tiny section of Essex at the moment. We're trying to expand it out to West Essex, to Harlow, and obviously to Charlie, with, with Archie, to rural Braintree, and looking at various other, other parts of Colchester and the north of Essex. What we are doing is we're working with, if I am connected to nature, these are the benefits that I'm getting. So in our education work that we are doing, we're working on a project where we're going into schools and teaching children about climate change. But we're really getting children also to feel good about themselves and to feel, to feel well. So the children who come and to contact with us in our education on environment are learning that I am part of nature and nature is part of me. This is how I look after nature through Leave No Trace Ethics. This is how I care for nature but this is how nature cares for me. So we've got this kind of virtuous cycle running where every single person who comes into contact with us in the way that we work and the way we facilitate our groups will leave us understanding that actually what happens to me happens to nature. And in my slides, which I've abandoned ship with, what I wanted us to look at is that we look at environmental decline in Great Britain. It's, it's a tragedy, we're aware of it but we've got to do something about it. But I absolutely see a connection with the decline in our well-being in Britain at the same time. And I do believe that we as a, as a, as a people are suffering from a kind of detachment of, of our connection to things. So this lack of connectivity of ourselves to ourselves, to each other and to nature is making us ill. And the statistics around mental health currently, it's not just Britain, it's across the whole wide world, are horrendous. So we are seeing one in four young people with anxiety or depression. I know that in this room, and I'm not going to ask anyone to put their hand up, but I know in this room there are going to be many, many people who've got family members, friends or others who are suffering with some form of mental health decline. And I do think we are suffering from nature deficit disorder, which the great uh, writer Richard Louv talked about in his book called Last Child in the Woods. And he talks about the fact that we are now disconnecting from nature. And our biggest danger with the many people that we are on this planet and in this country is that as we detach from nature, we detach from ourselves and each other and it makes us ill. But also our cities are growing. So we now know that across the world, most people are going to be living in urban areas. We also know that in urban areas, we have a decline in mental well-being. Where we've got high density housing, we see a decline in mental health. So when we're looking at planning, when we're looking at the state of Essex, as we grow and as people and more and more people move into our county, more and more of us need to be housed, more of our needs are needing to be met, we face a grave challenge because wild nature has the biggest impact on our well-being. And I'm not just saying that from a point of romantic emotionalism, which I can be very victim to, I, I will admit. Um, but we've done research now with Essex University since 2007, originally starting with Jules, Pretty, and myself, looking at wilderness immersion for young people, going into the wildest places we could find. Our research has been phenomenal. We can actually evidence now that the closer I feel connected to nature, the higher my level of self-esteem, the higher my level of hopefulness, the most amazing measure, because if we're not hopeful, we're not gonna to bother to do anything. So 
the more connected to nature I am, the more my behavior changes, the more my strengths grow, and the higher my resilience factors. So if we are going to run at risk the loss of wild space because we are such a high level of population, because we need housing, because we need to find renewable sources that eat land, what are we going to do? Because we have to find systems that are left intact with a sense of wildness to them while we meet the needs of the human population. And as a charity, we're deeply committed to people and we're deeply committed to nature, but we have to find the balance. And you know, when we look at Nature Needs Half with, with um, E.O. Wilson, which is probably where I'd prefer to be than 30% for nature, Frankly, when you look at people versus the natural world, we should probably be 80% for nature and 20% 20, 20 for people. But we know that that's not going to happen. And 30% is a good target to go for. But somewhere along the line, we have to find a balance. We have to be able to understand that wild nature is absolutely fundamental to the health and well-being of every single one of us and that it is entitled to its own sense of integrity, to its own sense of being able to exist without it being something that's manipulated continually by humans. So within our nature recovery that Simon does, it's incredible work to be doing. We have such ambition for Essex, but all of us are kind of working in our in our big ways, you know, Emma, Archie, Simon, us through education and mental health and well-being. Um, we are running uh, over 700 hours um, of mental health one-to-one -one counseling outside. We are running groups for domestic violence. We're running groups for young people who've really, really significantly struggling with complex needs. But every single one of them are depending on nature as the healer. So um, slightly going off track with that, but wanting to say, let's put a place for nature. Let's understand that our health and well-being is fundamentally connected, as Lord Deben very well put out to us just now. And to say that in our way of doing it, we're working through people to get them to connect. Through that connection, we can get them then to protect the natural world. We have to put it in balance. We have to keep an eye on it. And as Simon said, it's not just green spaces. It's having green spaces with a value to them. It's not just a woodland, it's having a woodland that's got the age with its biodiversity that's going to help us through climate change. Not only planting new trees, it's an end and an end and an end through all of these mechanisms together. So thank you for listening and um, let's keep doing this work because I think we all need to be in this together. Um, so we've got quite a bit of time for questions, thoughts, comments. Um, let's uh, see what some of them are. Uh, this is an oh, most of them are anonymous. Um, they're all anonymous. Okay. In the world of nature restoration, is there enough focus on creating nature for a future climate rather than restoring back to a previous, possibly rose-tinted view of nature? So, are we focusing enough on the future? You want to have a go? Who wants to have a go at that? I'm happy to kick it off, but um, um, I think it's a, it's a good point, and it's something that we we're very conscious of. So we put our ecological master plan together with reference to the past. So being being in a state, we're lucky enough to have lots and lots of information about what happened previously. One of which is a map that was hand drawn on vellum of 1618. So we've got that as a point of reference. We've got some of the old maps, some of the old records. So we've used that to inform what we're doing, but the actual structure of the project we've put together is very much focused on the future. So we are focusing on future nutrition demands. We're looking at future markets for food. We're looking at future climate. So we've actually brought in trees, for example, um, from the middle of France, which are five degrees further south, which is as close as we think we can get to the future climate we're likely to expect. And everything that we're doing is we're looking at future challenges. So, for example, um, looking around East Anglia, there's two main two statistics that kind of live with me and live in my head. One is under a high emission scenario um, of 4.4 uh, degrees temperature rise, which is is quite high, but is not out of the question by any means. The grade two, three arable land that produces the majority of our food in East Anglia and includes all of my estate 
could degrade down to grade four. So that then becomes poor agricultural land. So we need to try and mitigate for that. We need to try and adapt now to make sure that that doesn't happen. The second thing is from a water availability perspective in East Anglia, we're looking at by 2050, a 500 million litre per day shortfall. And that is for everything. So that is for energy generation. It is for um, your drinking water, our drinking water, and it's for agriculture. So it's about thinking about how do we how do we address these problems now? So this is why we've put a project together that tries to do all of these things now. And I'll be honest, a lot of the feedback we've got about it is you're trying to do too much. Why are you trying to sort out problems that don't currently exist? Why are you thinking so far ahead? But as a business, the business we are, I need to look at not the next generation, but the next generation and the one after and potentially the one after that. So I see these as risks. And those of you that run businesses in, in, in the room or organizations of any size, you'll be used to doing materiality assessments. You know, is this material to my business? Could it become material to my business? And my assessment of a lot of this stuff is that absolutely it is. I need to act now because if I don't act now, I won't be able to respond efficiently later. And in some cases, I will miss the opportunity. Thanks, Archie. Emma, do you want to say anything about are we focusing enough on the future rather than trying to get back to a possibly rose-tinted past? I mean, I think there's sort of an obvious thing when you're looking at farmland is to look at the changes that happened in, in, on farmland since the Second World War with removal of hedges and heavy drainage and, and all of that kind of stuff. But the reality is the way our farm landscape look is, is very far from a natural environment. So whilst there is that element of restoration, actually for me it is much more about the future and it's about looking at the farming practice um, as part of the, the whole vision of how the farm landscape needs to look. Um, there is an element of restoration, but it's all also about innovation for me on farms and the way we manage our farm businesses. Simon, can I just say something psychologically? I think one of the things that I, you know, that actually um, Lord Deben touched on was the loss of species. And we only know what we know. So, you know, there is the past and there is the future where we have to put our attention to. But for children growing up, for people who move new to this area, unless we know what there's been, we don't know where we're going. So I think that using the past as a matrix of knowledge from where we actually progress ourselves is the way to go forward. But we can't only look back, we have to look forward. But actually, most people don't know what there was. They don't know what they've lost. Uh, Robert mcfarlane has been doing some extraordinary books about the loss of language around nature, the loss of how we define things that are no longer here anymore. But unless we know what there was, we don't know really how to plan forward. Then we've got a question about the, the sort of the balance of, of farming. Um, with the current state of, of and scale of land use and ownership in Essex in mind, what will our farmland need to look like to balance our natural housing, energy and nutritional needs in the future, especially, especially to facilitate the evolving needs of modern lifestyles? And while, while our panel think about that, I mean, it's the question we're all asked all the time. I was at an NFU branch meeting not in Essex, Rob, you'll be glad to hear, in, in Hertfordshire the other day, where the question came up, it isn't my job to produce food? There are 8 billion people on the planet. They need to be, to be fed. Isn't that a greater priority than worrying about nature recovery or climate change? And I think that question is sort of looking at this and, and, uh, and what do we think that the balance should, should be and look like? I think sort of increasingly what farmers are, are doing is looking at the land that they, that they manage, be that land they own or land that they rent, and looking actually in this landscape that I'm responsible for, where is the most appropriate place for me to be growing and producing food? Um, whereas in the past the impetus might have been to, to grow as much food as possible in every corner of a farm, I think farmers as a group are, are recognising and... and and taking on board the fact that actually there is um, a need for farmers to produce food, but also to produce environmental outputs from their farm. And that's something that perhaps as a community, farmers are getting comfortable with. There's, there's some way, way to go on that. Um, but I think it, it's about managing the mar your land in a way where you're using your most productive areas to produce high yields of food where that's appropriate 
but then looking at other areas of your farm where actually producing food is not necessarily the most important thing to be doing on that part of land. Um, so I think it's about managing in a balanced and intelligent way rather than thinking we have to crop and produce food on every square inch of the land that we're managing. So I think it's a balanced approach. Do you, do you want to say anything about that? Yeah, I'd just like to pick up something that was um, one of the targets of the Climate Action Commission is around sustainable farmland, so sustainably managed farmland. And I think there is a danger that we try and perpetuate the problem that we have in the UK. We, we don't have that much land, so in comparison to, to other areas. So we need to be very clever about how we use it. And we need to actually try and do everything on all pieces of land. Whereas what we're quite used to doing is saying, this bit is for food, this bit is for environment, this bit is for housing, this bit's for transport. We need to be much more clever about how we use it. So, you know, the model we're doing is trying to have three or four different things that are being done on every patch of land, including food production, including climate resilience. One of the challenges that, that um, sits behind what Emma has said is that there are only so many ways you can make a business out of using land. And at the moment, the only things really you can get paid for are things you extract. So that would be that the food or the fiber from it or government subsidy. So really, there are some opportunities that are coming down the road, things like biodiversity net gain, where farmers can offset some um, harm that's done elsewhere plus a bit, plus 10 percent or ideally 20 percent or more. That gives an opportunity and it's the first opportunity I've seen during my working lifetime where we can actually derive a revenue that isn't based around extraction. And I think that's something not to forget, but it is about being complex. You've got to be ready to deal with complexity and both the, the, the investors, the, um, the farmers and the policymakers have got to be ready to be flexible and trusting to do this because we need a completely new land use system, not one that tells us to choose between system A or system B. Uh, yeah. Just, just one more on farming, then I've got one for you, for, for you Joe. Um, one a question is, how important is it the local planning authorities require 20% biodiversity net gain? And I know there's a bunch of uh, people from district councils here in the room, so it'd be useful, interesting to hear your two responses to that. Emma? Um, I would say it's pretty important, really. I think that if Essex as a county can go for that 20%, it does create opportunities for farmers and landowners to get involved in the market. I think at a lower rate than that, if we're looking at the 10%, there's, there's too much opportunity for um, BNG offsetting to happen within the development itself, depending on the quality of the land that's being built on. Whereas if we can go for that 20%, we know there are farmers in Essex that do have an appetite for BNG. Uh, we know that that's going to look slightly different depending on the type of farm business that, that we're looking at. But I think that 20% will ensure that there's at least a market available for farmers to participate in if we can get that. Do you want to add to that? Yeah, I'd entirely agree. Um, but I think looking much wider than just the farm space, um, you know, I, I've worked in the NGO sector and know how utterly impossible it is to continually secure grants to carry on doing the good stuff you're trying to do. So, you know, that ambitious target shouldn't be seen as just favouring those people that happen to own land or happen to have access to land. It is about everything. So it is about local authorities being able to drive high quality green space. It's about our local um, environmental charities being able to manage that land without having to be sat on the constant treadmill of grant applications. You know, this is this could be game changing. The, the higher the target, the more game changing it could be. The higher the target, the more attractive Essex is going to be to inward investment. There are nature. I'm sitting on a number of um, green finance panels at the moment, looking at this in a, at a national and international level, and they want ambition. Investors want ambition. They want pathfinders. They want people that have confidence because then they will see that those are the places they want to come. So if we want to drive Essex as being the best place to put your green pound, then we need to show that we have confidence in delivering it. And if we set the, the lowest possible target, they'll go somewhere else. Interesting. Um, now, Joe, firstly, um, a comment. 
My niece has massively benefited from being part of the Wilderness Foundation education programs. Thank you for all you do. Uh, that was the easy bit. Uh, is there a risk that open access to wilderness destroys the wildlife we are... Oh, this keeps moving. I hate IT. Is there a risk that, that open access to wilderness destroys the wildlife we are seeking to protect? So how do we balance access with biodiversity enhancement? Yeah, it's a big problem. Well, I think that what it is about teaching people how to access nature, if everybody remembers what happened during COVID, when suddenly nature became everybody's best friend, but actually we left trails of litter behind us. So I think that at the base of what we do is leave no trace ethics, countryside code. It's about being able to go into nature for everybody, but in a way that we actually take care and we're respectful and we leave things as we find them. And, you know, litter is one of my biggest bugbears in the world. I mean, honestly, I think, you know, as when I, in 20 years time, I'll be trailing up and down the A12 with my plastic bag, not being frightened of being run over by a truck because it won't matter then. But it just drives me bonkers. But actually, it's just purely down to education and enabling people to understand their own connection to what they are doing. If we can understand that and we can feel it and we take responsibility for it, then I think we can access wild places. We can love them, we can care about them, we can look after them, and we can actually be in them. But it's just how we do that, and that's purely down to education um, and connection. If, maybe, if I could just add my own two tuppenny worth on that. Um, I mean, the, 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 to me, the, the best answer to this is we need more places for nature. Um, because the, you've got Hatfield Forest at the minute, which I think 20 years ago got 100,000 visitors a year. I think now it gets 600,000 visitors a year. And it is a real issue. But the reason is in that part of Essex, there aren't enough nice places for nature to pe people to go and visit. So I think the number one thing has to be to deliver on these enhanced places for nature that, that, so that we, you know, we can spread it around, so to speak. So that there are more places for people to access and go to and enjoy. But, but equally, we all know that access can be a problem. You know, dog walkers, you know, can be an issue. Um, but we have to find a way of balancing that. And I think going back to the 20% net gain point is that if we had more funding, particularly to encourage farmers to make more space for nature, I certainly have a neighbor in, in Margareti. My, my dad was a tenant farmer just five or six miles from where we're sitting now. And one of our neighbors is very keen on being a receptor site for biodiversity net gain, says, I would be very happy to put in more permissive footpaths and to provide more access uh, if I'm given the, the, the help to support more, more, more space for nature. So I think, you know, there are, it is a real issue. We have to acknowledge that, but there are ways of, of, of trying to tackle it. No, too much talking from me and not enough reading as to what the next question is. Um, okay, how to get some funding? Oh gosh, I, I know who this is from. How to get some funding for the big green internet, a wildlife corridor from Epping to Malden, hopefully with another northern loop through Hatfield Forest, Eastern Park, Thanksgiving, Braintree and south to Malden. So I think this question, you know, this is all about uh, linking up woodlands and having more woodland restoration. But it's where are we going to get the funding for from that? Does anybody want to have a go at that? I can do yeah, I think it's it, the specific project is not, not one I know enough about to, to comment on, but I think it's all about working on a landscape scale, which, which clearly that looks like, but it's also about working in partnership with those that are already there. So, you know, find those organizations that have a vested interest in what you're doing. Find organizations that are already doing stuff on the ground and link in with them. You know, the days of competing between environmental projects are hopefully coming to an end. You know, I've, I've been part of it enough to know that it is the most dispiriting thing in the world where you're bidding for funds from a grant funder and you know that, you know, another charity down the road is bidding for funds and there has to be a choice between the two. The reality is, is that that is always going to be the case to a certain extent. But I think the fact that we're sitting in a room like this is to... There is an opportunity here for us all to work together. And I think that's the thing. 
Um, it's about finding the right vehicles for the right projects. And if you're looking for access to land, then go and talk to the people who ha already have that access. Maybe it's through a farm cluster, maybe it's through a catchment partnership, maybe it's through some other mechanism, through farming wildlife advisory group, I don't know. But it, then if you need trees, then talk to the people that want to supply trees. So it might be the Woodland Trust, it might be the Ed Essex Forest Initiative. You know, it's about not being too um, protective of our own ideas, but being cognizant of the bigger picture and trying to work together. And I think in Essex, actually, we're doing this really well. Um, and I think there's open, there's enough opportunity out there and enough ideas out there for all of us. Yeah, I'd just sort of add to that and say I think partnership working really is is the key to this. Um, I gave the example a little earlier of, our, of a pilot project that the farm cluster is working on. The, the part, that, that project is still growing, but that's bringing together um, water companies, it's bringing together the Environment Agency, it's beginning bringing together Essex Forestry Initiative, Wildlife Trust, RSPB, all working together on this project across 10 farms. And some of those partners, perhaps in the past, historically haven't had the easiest of working relationships, but actually part of the farm cluster is providing a central point for those organisations to come to, to work with the coordinators, to access farmers and landowners and redefine what our relationships with those organisations mean for us in Essex right now, leaving sort of any of our kind of baggage behind and actually taking the opportunity to work as partners because it's that, um, that sort of broad approach to the funding of this nature-based work that is key to making these cluster projects work and partnership is at the heart of that. So I would say collaboration is really the answer for that one. Okay, thank you. My only point, mine's probably a rather trite one, but I actually think that if we put environment first, we can actually bring in more funders. I think that um, local businesses, I mean, if we look at the money that swirls around for sport and various other things, we can put nature and build that picture up so that we can actually draw on a little bit more private income for this. I don't think in the economic crisis we're facing now, environment is at the top of any government's agenda, really, when it comes down to serious funding. I think we do have to find mechanisms where we can actually draw on the private, private industries and communities, but it has to be seen as vital, not just a nice to have. And it's changing that mindset that I think changes the funding. Um, one final question. Um, there's a couple of questions on conflict between biodiversity and renewables. Um, so one question is, um, if I can find the bloody thing, what are the conflicts of land use for biodiversity and renewables and the impacts on biodiversity of using wind turbines, solar farms, etc.? And then there's a similar question which says, with so many competing demands for land use, from solar to housing to food to areas for natural green space, a land strategy is vital. Without a UK government lead, how can Essex create its own land strategy with democratic support? Who wants to have a go at that? <laughs> Peter, you're the politician. <laughs> no, but, but, but any thoughts on the, on, the, on the balance between biodiversity, renewables, and then, and then the, the sort of the leadership about what we should be trying to do in Essex? I can, I, I can have, oh, Peter, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Um, I'm happy to have a go. I mean, in terms of renewables, um, that's not something we've we've got into particularly. But if you just look at some of the impacts of changing land use from, for example, arable to something else, and mostly what happens if we're thinking about solar farms, um, it, what tends to happen under those solar farms is it flips the land use into grassland, um, permanent grassland for 40 years. We modelled on our farm the change from moving away from arable on a small section and on a 50 hectare section, we reckon that we could stop anything up to nine tonnes of soil moving off the land per year. So, you know, just looking at it, thinking, well, OK, if there's a land use choice out there that allows us to transition that change and still produce food underneath it. And we're looking at the moment at some um, solar solar arrays where there are vertically mounted panels, which are suitable for doing agroforestry. So we've got our tree lines. We can also put solar lines in there. We can then, it's about, again, trying to get as much out of your land. Um, the land use framework piece is a very interesting one. 
Um, I think the, the, the challenge is striking a balance between providing a framework for decision making and zoning land to say you can and you can't do this. And I think the latter is a really risky place to end up because not only do we not know what our land is going to be capable of doing in 50 years time, it's also what are the demands on it? What do we actually need it to produce? Um, and that is something that I'm very nervous of is, is a sort of zoning approach. But in terms of a framework approach, if the framework, for example, included for every land use type, you have to do a full natural capital assessment to give you an idea of what the market and non-market outcomes of using that land are going to be, then I'd be fully in, fully in, in support of that because it allows you to then identify those trade-offs. And there are inevitably going to be trade-offs. Well, before I give it to Peter, who will give you the politically correct answer, because I, I, I want to give you just a, a view. I mean, I think if, if, if there's lack of UK government lead, we should bloody well do it ourselves. I mean, I, th I think the whole point of the local nature recovery strategy is A, to get big cross-sectoral buy-in, which is why we've got all these different sectors represented on, on our local partnership, uh, local nature partnership board, why we're going to go out to consultation to get everybody's views and take on this. And then we come up with a strategy ourselves that sets what we want to do in Essex. And I think that we should give a lot of emphasis and importance to that. Now Peter can tell you what we actually should do. Uh, thank you, Simon. Um, no, I think, I think uh, Archie and, and yourself, Simon, have actually covered it very well. Um, it's all about the flexibility and knowing what resources we have um, going forward and, of course, the time. Uh, the reason I said I wanted that too is because I need to finish this session at this time. Um, so, look, uh, Simon, thank you very much for leading that, and Joe and Archie um, and Emma, of course. And I'm sure you'll all agree that that was a really uh, interesting panel, stimulating. You're actually hearing what's happening um, on our Essex countryside, what is happening to it by the people that are involved in moving and shaking it in a way, and how it is evolving with our circular economy and with the flexibility and the long-term uh, ambition to move it towards um, net zero as well. OK, well, I hope you enjoyed your coffee. Uh, now we've got a really um, good start to our keynote address here from Tony uh, Juniper, CBE. I'm sure most of you uh, have probably know of him or have seen him around over the years. I just want to give you a little bit of a background before he delivers his keynote uh, speech. Of course, uh, he is the official nature, uh, works for the, uh, oh, sorry, he's chair of the official nature conservation agency, Natural England. Um, and of course, that's taking on more and more importance. And I think that role is becoming very well known um, across the whole of the UK. But before he took up the role in it, in, April 19, he was the chief, um, he was the executive director for advocacy and campaigns at the World Wildlife Fund in the UK. Um, and he's also been a fellow of the University of Cambridge Institute on, for Sustainability, Leadership and President of the Wildlife Trust. So it's more and more. And uh, he began his career as an ornithologist, um, which is really interesting because um, I, I think uh, the amount of birds that we have in the UK that visit and go uh, is, is quite exceptional and we, we need to have that environment for all of our, our birds which are facing more and more difficulties I think with changing temperatures and navigation um, and the limits that they can go on. So um, initially he led the campaign too for the tropical rainforest from 2003 and 8 and was the organisation's executive director um, and lastly but not least from 2000 to 2 and 8 he's been vice chair of the Friends of the Earth International. So it sounds like he's done an awful lot, and I know because I've, I've met Tony a few times before at other events, um, and he's a great, a great uh, speaker and very knowledgeable. So, Tony, Thank you. it's all, all yours. I don't know if whether you want to speak here or yeah, you'll I'll go on the lecture. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, well, thank you very much, uh, Peter. It's an absolute pleasure to be here this morning and to share a few reflections on some of these overlaps between the climate change emergency and what we need to do on the parallel emergency linked to the decline of the natural environment. I was going to start actually where Lord Deben did this morning in a similar vein in observing some of the changes that have occurred in how we think about the climate change subject uh, over time. Uh, because in addition to this uh, diminishing of denial and acceptance of reality, 
the whole uh, practical implications of the issue are being transformed, literally, as we sit here today. And when I was first involved in all of this in the late 1980s, this seemed like a very distant theoretical threat and something that was in the horizon, maybe something that our children would have to worry about. But as Lord Deben said, it's in the here and now. And actually, we are in a period of consequences. And with that phrase, period of consequences, I just want to quote somebody who said some uh, words in 1936, which I think perhaps sum up the position we're in now. And this is Winston Churchill speaking in the House of Commons in November 1936 as the storm clouds of war gather in Europe. He said, the era of procrastination, of half measures, of soothing and baffling expedients, of delays is coming to a close. In its place, we are entering a period of consequences. We cannot avoid this period. We are in it now. Very strong words. He didn't say that we need a proportionate and pragmatic approach. He said this is an emergency that we need to lean into because the consequences are with us now. And this, I think, is a solid parallel with the need now to mobilise action to deal with this climate change challenge. And talking of consequences, anyone looking at the headlines of uh, the climate reports and indeed even into the mainstream press as recently as last month, September, you will have seen some terrifying uh, accelerations in the global average temperature. 1.5 degrees above the long-term average during September. If you go back to July, hottest month on record, followed by August, the hottest month on record, followed by September, the hottest month on record. The climatologists telling us that this was the hottest period for 120, I was expecting 120 years. 120,000 years is what the climatologists were telling us. Well outside the conditions that humankind has evolved in during the Holocene, we're into new territory. A completely different climatic regime that humankind has never experienced before. And not only high temperatures, but more extreme weather conditions. Storm Babette um, that John was talking about the consequences of in Suffolk. I saw some of that uh, in that county just two weeks ago with people's homes being flooded. There's another one coming uh, tomorrow. Uh, hot, hot on the heels of that previous very low pressure system, bringing probably four inches of rain to southern England to a countryside which is already soaking wet. And we know what the consequences of that are likely to be in some places. The excessive ocean temperature this year off the scale uh, during the early summer, uh, four and a half degrees above anything recorded before the northeastern Atlantic temperature in the sea. I mean, this is a reflection of, uh, for many decades, the heat that's being trapped in the atmosphere, it's being absorbed by the oceans. And it's beginning to come out in different ways, including through those kinds of extreme events. The Antarctic sea ice melting, including under the West Antarctic ice sheet. You may have heard a headline last week suggesting that if that becomes detached and it's being undermined by warm seawater getting under a massive ice shelf, that would lead to a five metre increase in sea level. This is the kind of consequences that we're now leaning into. And of course, it's not just the climate change side of this, which is an emergency. It is also the parallel decline of nature. Several manifestations of that. One is the destruction of ecosystems. And you see the statistics all the time in terms of how much ancient woodland is left in this country, how much rainforest is being destroyed in the Amazon, what's happening to the coral reefs. That is one of the big drivers of species loss. Uh, we're looking at a projected one million species to be uh, going extinct during the course of this century. That's a mass extinction uh, on a scale that's not been seen for millions of years on this planet. And as alongside the degradation of ecosystems and the loss of species is the decline in the abundance of wildlife. The WWF Living Planet Index uh, done with ZSL looking at all the data that we have about vertebrate populations going back to 1970, so just over 50 years ago, a 70% decline in the population on average of vertebrates, air-breathing vertebrates, birds, mammals, reptiles. This is a fundamental rapid change that's taking place. Now, the thing about all of this, which I think is very, very important to uh, ask oneself, is in spite of all of the evidence, 
and the IPCC reports and the IPBES reports, they're quite recent. They're published in the last couple of years. We've had this stuff for 30 years. At the time of the Earth Summit in Rio in 92, similar reports were being prepared and published. They were talking about the future rather than the current reality. What we're now living in is the current reality that was being set out 30 years ago. But the projections that were being set out then, they've been largely ignored. And it's very important to ask ourselves the question as to why that is. And I think if you look back through the decisions that have been made to delay this environmental policy, to weaken that environmental goal, to go into reverse on this ecological agenda, you nearly always find an economic rationale because it's going to be too expensive, it's going to slow down economic growth, and therefore that's going to damage the prospects of people uh, for better lives, for comfort, it's going to slow down poverty reduction. And so at every turn, our economic system is trumping the ecosystem. We are putting growth in the economy above uh, the health of the natural world. Now, you will have noticed the Stern Review, many of you published in 2006, that told us that actually this is literally a false economy we're inventing. We've got completely the wrong end of the stick because what's going to happen as a result of unmitigated global warming is that the costs and the loss and the damages caused by that are going to damage the economy in ways which are far more expensive than what needs to be done to avoid the problem in the first place. A couple of percent of GDP globally would solve this problem. And actually, just thinking back to Winston Churchill and his warnings in the 1930s, we spent 30% of GDP defeating the Axis powers. Leaning into the global warming uh, challenge is actually a far less of an economic uh, cost for us. But we just need to understand that taking a choice to protect the uh, prices in the short term which actually is a false economy, as, as John said, because the renewables now are cheaper than the gas anyway. Uh, we have fallen into a trap whereby we are um, fundamentally disintegrating two things which are completely connected, the economy and the ecosystem. The Stern Review um, put out some figures which were really quite impactful. What has been um, less talked about is the value of nature for the economy. Now, there's a really fantastic paper published in Nature uh, by an environmental economist called Robert Costanza. And he was using data from 2011 to publish in a 2014 paper in Nature, basically looking at the value of ecosystems to the global economy. I won't trouble you with all the details, but just to cut a long story short, that he found that pollination, water purification, nutrient recycling, contributions to public health, food and fiber production, the capture of carbon, the reduction of flood risks around coasts, marine capture fisheries. If you add up the value of all of those things to the economy, they're worth about $125 trillion per year in 2014 money. In that same year, global GDP was 75 trillion. So the ecosystem is providing a considerably bigger economic contribution than global GDP. And yet we obsess about the growth in GDP at the same time as diminishing the nature which actually fundamentally underpins the whole thing. This is the economics of the madhouse, I would argue. And I think what we need to do is to recognize that the reasons why we have not done what we need to do, namely economic reasons, they are fundamentally flawed because the alternative opposite is the truth that if we do not halt the rapid global warming, if we do not avert a mass extinction and look after habitats and nature, then the economic costs are going to be far bigger than any savings we're convincing ourselves we're going to make in the short term. So this is the fundamental flip that's needed. And it's one that, uh, fortunately, quite a lot of people can see that we can actually navigate by going low carbon and high nature at the same time. And there are uh, many reasons to be optimistic about how we do this. Uh, and one of the reasons to be optimistic is through this new prism of green infrastructure that people are beginning to talk about. So green infrastructure, all of those things that I just said, flood risk reduction, uh, water purity, uh, the provision of pollinating insects, places for people to enjoy to improve their health and well-being, all of it is providing a service which has, is as fundamentally as important as electricity or transport, I would argue, and yet what we don't do yet 
is to plan the provision of green infrastructure as we would a road network or an electricity grid. So if you accept the fact that nature is hugely important economically, that it should be seen as infrastructure for society, would you, if you take the roads analogy, would you build a road by starting one mile of it on one side of the county and another mile of it on another side of the county and not connect them? You would be, you would be accused of being irrational, wouldn't you? Uh, but when it comes to nature and green infrastructure, that's exactly what we do. A random bit of nature here, a random nature reserve there, another intervention over here, all of which are individually quite good, as a mile of road would be disconnected from any other road, or another mile of road would be. But actually, if you connect those roads up and actually start to join the villages and the towns, they become much more useful. And so it is with green infrastructure. We need the right habitats in the right places for the right reasons. And one of the things that was being talked about earlier was this uh, question of, of land use planning. And um, just to put that question in a slightly different context, in this country, we have about 130,000 square kilometres is the area of England. And to uh, depend upon that uh, area of land, we have about 55 million people, English citizens and people living here. If you divide one by the other, you realise it's not an awful lot. And on that not of awful lot, we need to produce a large amount of food. We need to produce a lot of energy to meet our water needs. Uh, we need places for recreation, for carbon capture, for biodiversity recovery, plus all of the infrastructure, plus all of the housing. And if you start to think about all of those competing demands, uh, I think logically you would come to the conclusion that you need a framework to be able to work through what is the best thing to put in what place. Where are the best places for the high quality nature? Where are the best places for the houses? Where is the best place for the water supply assets and, and so on and so forth. But at the moment, we don't do that. It's all a bit piecemeal. Now, what Simon said, which is a very, very important point, um, is that we do now have an opportunity to start drawing some much more strategic conclusions about land use and where the best place for different things uh, could be as a result of the opportunity of the local nature recovery strategies. So this is something which is new, which is very exciting. At Natural England, we see this as one of the key delivery routes that we have for what is the biggest idea at the heart of our work, which is this notion of a nature recovery network. So this was something that was in the 25 year environment plan. A lot of complexity behind what do we mean by a nature recovery network? But what I would mean is a multifunctional uh, set of areas which are connected, which are large, which are high quality, which are biodiverse, which are providing multiple functions to reduce flooding, to catch carbon, and to provide places for people to uh, visit and enjoy at the same time as, as recovering the biodiversity. That's what I would mean by a nature recovery network. And of course, it's a big national idea. Uh, and the only way it's going to be delivered uh, is if people are doing this in a local context. And we did think about this quite a lot at Natural England a few years ago. What would be the local context which would be ideal for this? Would it be at the level of a parish? Would it be an English region like East Anglia? We thought actually probably something like an English county would be about the right scale for which to be able to have enough strategic impact at the same time as having enough accountability and buy-in from the public and all of the different actors to be able to do this job in a way which was effective. And so what you now see is the rolling out of that policy um, after um, it was uh, included in the Environment Act in 2021. And now work is going on across the country to bring people together to start to work through what those local nature recovery networks could look like in the context of those particular counties. And doing something here is going to be very different to doing something in Cumbria. And doing something in Yorkshire is going to be different to Cornwall. The places are different. The economy is different. The culture is different. The pressures on the land and the sea are different. And so being able to nest this conversation at the level of a county, hopefully, can help us reflect a global emergency which is being taken forward through national policies, including a nature recovery network, which is one of the delivery routes for 30% protected by 2030, and do that national work in that global context through the bottom-up uh, delivery via um, a, a county 
process. And this is a really important thing um, to, to kind of have in mind as, as we're wondering about how this work kind of goes and how it fits. And it reminds me, actually, of a, of a, of a slogan we had at Friends of the Earth when I went to work there in 1990. A uh, global network of grassroots organisations. We had a slogan that said, think globally, act locally. And we had a very strong network of local organisations. And that was, I think, um, a real piece of wisdom from the founders of that organisation in understanding that climate, resource depletion, nature decline, these are massive global challenges, but you cannot do anything about them unless it is a collective global grassroots effort, which is what you're engaged with here. And it could not be more important to get this right. Because if you get it right in Essex, people will copy it in Buckinghamshire. And they might even start copying it in France and Belgium and Germany and Swaziland and goodness knows where else. Because the thing that galvanises action in the face of these huge challenges is people doing stuff. And it was wonderful to listen to that panel earlier on with, with uh, Joe and Emma and, and Archie and Simon talking about the local situation of real stuff that's happening. Because this is the kind of activity that unleashes the hope and the energy and the inspiration to do what's needed. And what is needed is really quite a big set of changes. We're going to have to transform our impact on the Earth in quite a short order if we're going to avoid two, three, four degrees of global warming and a mass extinction event, which for reasons of economy as well as ethics, we must do. And so the local nature recovery strategies, and this point has been made earlier on, are a fantastic opportunity to start integrating, to start coming with holistic approaches, because part of the reason why we've not prevailed in meeting environmental goals with the speed at which we need to meet them over time, I think, is in part down to not only a, a, a misunderstanding of the economic reality, but also a fragmentation of effort into silos. And so what we have to do is to break the silos and to start integrating different policies. And the local nature recovery strategies will be one way of doing that by enabling us to use the new farming policy and to be able to combine that with biodiversity net gain, to combine that with what water companies might do, for example, in terms of how they wish to contribute to the future security of their businesses through green infrastructure. I know Abbotton Reservoir, a really great example of how actual infrastructure is linked with green infrastructure. And it's actually the same thing, a really great example of, of leadership there. And so being able to, to have these integrated approaches with the different um, routes for change being pulled together against an overall map that says where the green infrastructure could be, this is going to be a breakthrough. So that's one level of integration is bringing together these different tools and policies um, and indeed the actors. And the actors are not only the traditional environmental groups, of course, I mentioned the water companies, very key player, the housing companies, the infrastructure providers, of course, the NGOs, local government, and also the national agencies like Natural England and Environment Agency, all bringing our particular pieces of the puzzle to hopefully create a coherent jigsaw picture where we put in the different pieces to be able to show how that green infrastructure is not only a map, but it's being delivered by all of those different people using their different budgets, their different expertise, their different routes to influence to be able to pull together something that none of them could do on their own. So that's about integrating the tools, the farming policy, the BNG, the protected areas and everything else that we've got, integrating the different actors, the farmers, the local authorities uh, and the official agencies amongst others. And then the other thing that we can integrate at the same time if we're smart is the outcomes. And I mentioned this a moment ago. Can we, in the same landscape, catch carbon, recover nature, clean up the rivers, prevent flooding and provide good places for people to visit? Yes, we can. And there are examples of this across the country. And in a nation with limited land and many people, this is exactly the kind of thing that I think we need to do. So I'm hugely inspired by what I've heard already this morning and to um, see the leadership being shown in Essex. And uh, I do hope that we will see more of this across the country over the coming couple of years as the local nature recovery strategies come into being, as we see this alignment between the response to the nature emergency and the climate emergency getting more joined up. And as a result of doing things that we can actually start to turn around uh, a very big tanker at a time of very big consequences. I'll stop there. Thanks very much indeed, everybody. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Tony, for that. Uh, just a few questions uh, while we've got five minutes, that's OK. Um, is resilience a function of an individual organisation or a function of a group, a collective, a community, a business sector, a village, a town or in a society? Complicated um, question. Yeah, so um, I think it's all of those. And um, maybe before going any further, just, just to kind of reflect on what we mean by resilience. And I remember some years ago, actually, hearing that word simultaneously in the same week come from the Pentagon about military kind of infrastructure at the same time as coming from the Transition Towns movement, um, who were trying to build grassroots kind of responses to climate change. And both of them were using the word resilience, which caused me to ponder, actually, what do we mean by this? Because you've got very different actors talking about it. And I think um, what it comes down to is the ability to withstand a shock and then to recover from it. And so, you know, this then happens at multiple levels. Um, it, 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 it is there sufficient capability in an organisation um, to be able to, you know, take a hit um, and then come back from that. And some of that's about finance, some of it's about its internal culture, some of it's about its disaster planning. And um, I think, you know, there's a highly kind of um, variable level of preparedness to be resilient in the face of what's coming. And some organisations have kind of understood this and they're kind of thinking about it. Uh, others, are, I think, are struggling. I know in the water sector in this country, for example, you know, there's really quite big worries about the extent to which we have underinvested in, in water, water storage assets, especially in the southeast of England. In fact, someone mentioned the number earlier, didn't they, um, about the gap between supply and demand as the climate becomes more volatile. Did you mention it, John? 500 million litres a day or something in East Anglia. Um, but the... Uh, but the lack of resilience in the system as a result of not fully appreciating and embracing these particular questions, um, you know, it becomes obvious whenever we get, get a hit. Uh, so that storm in East Anglia a couple of weeks ago caused a lot of flooding. I saw it close up. Um, people weren't expecting that. We don't kind of get that weather in East Anglia. And so the resilience for being able to deal with a lot of water all at once, it kind of wasn't there. But we're going to have to prepare for more of that as we go along and to be able to, to think through the strategies to deal with it. OK, thank you. Um, the, this question, I think, uh, is uh, where, where has government's commitment to deliver public access to nature through Elms disappeared to? Um, I don't know. You'll have to ask the minister. OK. <laughs> OK, um, against, uh, sorry, against uh, your very strong arguments on economy, why is the government not listening and why, why do they go short term? I think you covered that in a way. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK, um, next question I got here is, I believe major nature investors are looking for projects of um, up to 30 million. Given our already fragmented landscape and high population levels, how can we step up to develop projects at sufficient scale? Yeah, so this is a really good question. So um, for quite a long time now, we've kind of been thinking there is potentially quite a lot of private sector finance um, that could be invested in, in nature recovery. And so some of this actually now is beginning to happen. We've got biodiversity net gain coming, which will be a transfer of money from developers to, to nature recovery. Uh, we've got the nutrient mitigation scheme that we've been running at Natural England, which is freeing up housing permissions through compensating for nutrient pollution that otherwise would go into rivers and wetlands. Uh, there's a carbon market which is um, underpinned by the Woodland Carbon Code and the Peatland Code. So we've got some of this already, but it, it, it needs to go wider and bigger. And um, I don't think it's down to the amount of land area we've got. I think this is a challenge which is much more linked to putting the, su the, the supply and demand together. So the buyers and sellers into a much stronger, clearer relationship. And Archie would know more about this in terms of some of the ways in which, you know, the potential transfer of private sector investment to land managers, it's kind of blocked by 
Well, is it real? Do we actually know um, whether these benefits are going to be delivered? Uh, what's the kind of standard that we need to be um, working to? And I think some people in the financial sector, they kind of look around and they think, well, maybe not for us, not yet, because it looks a bit risky. But where you do have a standard and where you do have a rule, biodiversity net gain and nutrient mitigation, you can see that money is beginning to flow. And so I think probably what we need is some clearer standards uh, which set out what good looks like for private sector investment and then some organisations that hopefully are quite trusted to be able to say whether those standards have been met. And so Natural England, for example, could be an organisation that would you know, work with landowners and people buying uh, ecosystem services and saying, yes, you know, major bank wants to buy biodiversity credits to offset its kind of global whatever it's looking at. And um, in this locality in Essex or in Norfolk, there's been a delivery of a biodiversity gain, which actually is sufficient to count for those credits. Therefore, tick, it's a good project. And so having some more of that against some clearer standards, I think would unlock quite a lot of money. Um, but at the moment, you know, it's slightly limited. And I don't believe that the doubts and uncertainties created around the nutrient mitigation scheme uh, during the late summer were especially confidence building for people investing in ecosystem markets in England, if I can put it that way. One very, just one very quick question, because I know there's so many questions coming up and obviously we can't get them all. But um, you talk, it's, uh, and I'm just taking this at random here. You talk about climate emergency and nature depletion emergency. Can we combine it with mental health emergency and cost of living yeah. crisis and come up with a joined up multifaceted solution? Yeah, well, this is, this is the key thing um, that modern society must master is systems thinking. And the fact that all of these challenges, cost of living, climate change, nature depletion, they're, they're, they're all connected to one another uh, in different ways. And, and John touched on some of this during his opening remarks. And we need to get far more skillful at this idea of holistic thinking leading to integrated action. And at the moment, we, we do things in silos and we, we don't necessarily see the connections. And so the recent debate about cost of living and climate is a good example where, in fact, you can see that being very ambitious on climate change would actually help on the cost of living. And so, you know, that kind of join up is, um, is still absent sometimes in how we think. I mean, the media discourse is, is full of kind of binary choices. I mean, the trouble with integrated... Uh, solutions is they're slightly harder to explain and they don't lend themselves to the kinds of ping pong debates we have in British society where everything has to be for or against uh, rather than everything all at once, both and. And so we need to find ways of being able to master that system's thinking in a much better way than we presently do. On the health side, actually, there is this concept of one health, uh, which might be looking up whoever asked the question, which is about seeing that the health of nature and the health of people uh, are basically one and the same thing. And there's actually quite a lot of science on this uh, in terms of the main determinants of, of you know, health outcomes at population scale. They're environmental in different ways. Access to green space, absence of pollution uh, being two of the things that you can point to. So um, uh, the good thing is, uh, in that kind of question, is that we have a ton of data now which kind of traces the connections between these things. So we don't have to be making kind of what's the word, kind of um, abstract kind of points about all of this. We can actually show that access to green space is very good for public health and well-being. And in fact, I was looking at some figures yesterday. Contribution of access to green space to the British economy, about £28 billion a year. Uh, much of that in avoided public health costs. So if people have more access to high quality natural areas with a lot of wildlife in them, they become less stressed. Uh, they tend to have better physical health their mental health improves, and that will save us a dead load of cash down the track on, on, the, uh, on the public health side. Uh, one piece of work we did at Natural England, I think it was based on some studies we did in Norfolk, where we discovered that every pound invested in access to high quality, nature rich green space avoided seven pounds for the national health uh, costs down the track. I mean, this, this is um, you know, powerful stuff. If we can find ways of drawing this into the policy discussion and starting to make connections between different bits of the equation. And the green infrastructure frame is a really good one because it joins together 
climate adaptation, public health and well-being, carbon capture, nature recovery, um, inward investment into, you know, towns and cities. You know, investors don't want to go to degraded places that are polluted where everyone's miserable. They want to invest in places where they've got a motivated workforce who wants to stay there. And those are the places where the house builders will get a better return as well. So this stuff does all join up. Uh, but we've got to get beyond these binary uh, uh, choices, which aren't choices at all. They are, they are false kind of um, propositions for the most part. OK, uh, thank you very much, Tony. Um, okay. we'll, we'll finish the, the, the questions there on that. Okay. But Tony, thank you very much for all that. Uh, we've now got a session focusing uh, on biodiversity and net gain. And I'd like to welcome uh, to the stage uh, two experts, uh, Rob Bishop and John Meehan. And um, Rob Bishop is, um, just to give you a little bit of idea, is also from Natural England. And he's providing advice to local authorities and uh, on biodiversity and, and net gain as well. And he's previously worked as an ecology consultant uh, based in Cambridge. So uh, not only have we got more on this now, we've got John Meehan, who is our very own uh, officer here, who is head of climate adaptation and mitigation at, uh, at our Essex County Council. He's worked in Essex and East London for 30 years previously as director of Thames Chase Community Forest and Environmental Charity, Groundwork South Essex. And I know from working with John of his passion for not only trees and green spaces and everything else. So again, I think uh, we're going to hear two very, very interesting uh, speakers talk um, about biodiversity and what's going to happen. So I'd um, like to ask them to both to come up. Hello, everyone. Um, I must admit, it's a tough act for us to follow on from Tony Juniper. Uh, but in fact, I think John and I may have been a little bit stitched up there. <laughs> But it's really great to be invited here to present at such an inspiring event. Um, and Tony's speech really highlights how critical it is that we start to see rapid change on the ground for nature's recovery. So I've been asked to talk a bit about um, biodiversity net gain and how it will work in Essex. So I'm going to talk about the concept, the metric and the general process. And then I'll hand over to John, who's going to talk a bit more about the practicalities for Essex. So biodiversity net gain is a new approach to development that aims to leave nature in a measurably better state than before it took place. Um, and it's one of the key delivery mechanisms for the Greater Essex Local Nature Recovery Strategy, with that strategy helping to guide BNG habitat into the best strategic places. Now, a key message here for me is that BNG is additional to what we already have in terms of policy protection, uh, existing policy and legal protection. It does not replace anything. So under the new timetable, um, major developments in England will be required to deliver a 10% net gain in biodiversity from January 2024. The end of November, we're expecting all the regulations and guidance um, from government and the timetable for small sites and nationally significant infrastructure projects remains unchanged. I wanted to briefly talk about the mitigation hierarchy which is in the National Planning Policy Framework um, and is a really important um, hierarchy, which essentially sets out that impacts should always be avoided first before looking at mitigation, which is reducing the effect, and finally, compensation as a last resort. Now, BNG is often spoken about a lot in terms of habitat creation and offsetting, um, but we also need to remember that net gain is really about reinforcing this mitigation hierarchy. As I said earlier, it does not replace existing legal or policy protections. It's additional to what we already have. And what I think is quite exciting for ecologists is that it allows us to um, quantify and better value those habitats that may not have formal designation or be a specific priority, but we know still have value for nature. And the metric also um, penalises the clearance of more valuable habitats which incentivizes their retention and protection within the design scheme. So ultimately, it's in the developer's interest to start looking at this, um, because otherwise achieving their 10% net gain will be far more difficult and costly. So how does it actually work? Um, a suitably qualified ecologist would undertake habitat surveys um, of a development site. This data um, is then entered into the DEFRA biodiversity metric. Now, the metric converts habitats to what we call biodiversity units, which are essentially a proxy for biodiversity value. And the, the habitats are assessed before and after the development to measure a change in those biodiversity units, which is shown as a percentage score. 
and developers would have to demonstrate a 10% net gain in biodiversity. So that's 10% on top of no net loss. A few bits about the metric. So um, it takes into account a number of different factors to determine the number of biodiversity units. This includes the habitat size, its condition, its relative quality, which is determined using some condition assessment criteria in the field. Habitat distinctiveness, is it of a particular ecological importance? Um, and again, the metric sort of predetermines this value based on habitat type. As an example, ancient woodland would have the highest level of habitat distinctiveness. Strategic significance, is the habitat in a strategic location? So again, this is where the local nature recovery strategy comes in. Um, and the metric gives you a greater number of units based on this. Either you're formally adopted in a local plan or strategy, or you're in an ecologically desirable location. And this is how the local nature recovery strategy can help to guide habitat into those best locations. Other factors for habitat creation include the difficulty of creating certain habitat and the time it takes to complete. Um, so the metric penalizes based on this, but, but again, it kind of discourages developers from clearing those more valuable habitats. Spatial risk, so you're rewarded for more local habitat creation either within the same local authority boundary or within the national character area. Um, so this incentivizes is kind of local habitat creation. And generally there is a preference for on-site first. A few other points. So area-based linear and water courses are all dealt with separately in the metric. So what this means is you need to deliver 10% gain for each of those. You can't have a 7% gain in habitat and a 3% gain in hedgerows as an example. There are trading rules in the metric. Um, so what this broadly means is that like for like or like for better habitat replacement is required at the same or higher level of distinctiveness. This is to avoid swapping out of certain habitat types. The metric also rewards you for creating habitat well in advance of the development impact. And there are sort of three options here in terms of how you deliver your mandatory B and G for a developer. So and there's expected to be a bit of a spatial hierarchy here with a preference for on-site first before moving to local offsetting. What we mean by on-site is within the development red line boundary through habitat creation, whether that's landscaping or green infrastructure. Off-site is using other land holdings or um, purchasing biodiversity units from local habitat banks and providers, preferably in a local strategic location. The statutory credit scheme is is meant to be the last resort really. Um, and this is where statutory credits can be purchased, but they are charged above the market rate. So they're quite, they're very expensive um, and developers would have to show that they've exhausted all other options before going down this route. And these would be reinvested in national habitat creation projects. So a bit on monitoring and evaluation, There's, there will be a national site register, um, which all offsite habitats will need to be registered for. Um, and meet the relevant eligibility criteria. This will be publicly accessible, so it's designed to be transparent and avoid double counting. We're also expecting reporting templates for both um, biodiversity net gain plans and habitat management and monitoring plans, some of which are, was actually published a couple of days ago in draft form. So this will provide a standardized, consistent approach to hopefully help developers and local authorities. There's also a commitment to review the metric every three to five years, and there's a quality assurance project that will run for 18 months after it becomes mandatory. This is a partnership project trying to look at um, BNG being delivered to a high standard, and it will monitor the progress and see how the concept plays out on the ground in the first few years. So local nature recovery strategies are really important um, for driving the delivery of BNG. And the Greater Essex Local Nature Recovery Strategy will be a spatial plan for the county, identifying opportunities and priorities for habitat creation and enhancement. The expectation is that it will help to inform and guide the best strategic locations for BNG delivery. And this is incentivized through the metric strategic significance score. I want to talk a little bit about green infrastructure. I know it's already been mentioned earlier by Tony. Um, Green infrastructure is broadly about multifunctional, connected green and blue spaces close to where we live and work. Um, and well-designed, we know that green infrastructure plays an important role, not just for nature, 
but also for climate resilience, flood risk mitigation and health and well-being, as well as a host of other um, important factors. Well-designed green infrastructure can help to make places more resilient and adaptive to climate change by contributing to floodwater management, sequestering carbon, urban cooling and active travel. And there's been a lot of work on this locally in the last few years, including the local Essex green infrastructure standards and a natural England's green infrastructure framework. Now, there are clearly strong links here between good design of green infrastructure and the delivery of on-site biodiversity net gain, close to where the development impact is happening um, to deliver benefits for both nature and people. We do, of course, need to be realistic in terms of designing habitats to think about how public access may influence the feasibility of certain habitat types. And sensitive design is really important to get this balance right. A bit on local policy. So local policies for B&G can be really important for setting out the requirements in Essex and also providing that clear guidance for developers, planners and consultants. It's an opportunity to embed those local priorities in policy and to secure those better strategic outcomes that are rewarded through the metric. Local authorities can also consider higher targets above the mandatory minimum. And this is something that the Local Nature Partnership has really set an ambition for. The key thing is that any higher target needs to be robust and backed up by evidence to avoid any uh, challenge down the line. So I wanted to finish by talking a bit about some of the potential benefits of biodiversity net gain. Now I spoke earlier about it reinforcing the mitigation hierarchy and allowing us to start to better um, value and quantify all habitat types in the planning system. It will undoubtedly raise the importance and profile of ecologists in the development process and within local authorities. Now more than ever, the environment will need to be considered as early as possible in the design scheme. There will also be potentially more opportunities for habitat creation and enhancement, providing nature both close to where we live and work, but also in those strategic high value areas for connectivity. It will be a longer term investment in nature all off-site and significant on-site habitats will need to be managed for 30 years minimum. It's a key delivery mechanism for the Essex Local Nature Recovery Strategy, as well as other local environmental targets set within Essex. And there may be benefits through climate change adaptation and mitigation, designing or restoring habitats that have additional benefits in terms of carbon sequestration, urban cooling and flood risk management. It's certainly not a silver bullet, and there are challenges in implementing this successfully, but it is potentially a game changer in delivering better outcomes for nature and sustainable development and an exciting opportunity to hopefully see positive change on the ground. Thank you for listening. I'll hand over to John now. Great. Thanks, Rob. I think that's the clearest explanation I've ever had a biodiversity net gain, which is a, a very complicated subject. So um, what I want to talk about is what, what does this mean to Essex? Um, and bi biodiversity net gain, there, there are several views on it. So up here are the uh, two different views um, from practitioners in Essex. Uh, one is a, a, an optimistic landowner who gave me this equation, which was profit was around about £200 per acre. So a hectare is a profit, a, approximately about £500 a hectare. And he reckoned that on average, he might expect six biodiversity units per hectare, which at 20,000 per hectare was around about 120,000. And if he divided that by the 30 years, you get a figure of 4,000 uh, pounds per hectare. So that's an opinion, uh, but it shows you a kind of optimistic opinion. The second view, and I, I feel a bit guilty now about saying pessimistic land agent for all the land agents in the room, uh, let's say it's a cautious land agent view, which is what we buy, what we uh, commission land agents for. Um, so his view was BNG is a semi-permanent land use change, um, potentially reducing the price of land, which is based on agricultural productivity. And what's interesting about that is that's the way we currently base our land uh, values on. It'd be interesting going forward whether actually biodiversity productivity will start to play into that value, land value system. He also said that BNG is a one-off payment, usually right at the beginning of your 30 years, obviously, and you really have to think hard about that um, investment because you've got to get all your costs out of that. 
you've got to get all your labour, all your fuel, all your M&E that, that Rob has talked about, the monitoring and evaluation, uh, and any unpredicted things that might happen, like a war in Europe, when suddenly um, fuel goes up by four times its uh, value. So he was saying, you need caution. And then finally, he said that there's an accounting uncertainty about BNG because it's an upfront lump sum. And if you think it's devaluing your capital, then could it actually be a capital part disposal or an upfront payment on a long-term management plan? So there's a number of questions that are still not quite answered. And in addition to that is the whole issue of inheritance tax. You get inheritance tax on agricultural land. Will you get it on, on, on nature areas? So what I'm saying is, you know, the jury's slightly out, but there's two different views, really interesting uh, debate. So what we did in Essex is, uh, it's already been mentioned, we did a study uh, funded by the Natural Environment Investment Readiness Fund and looked at four sites in the, uh, uh, in the nature conservation area, sorry, in the climate focus area, too many designations, climate focus area in the north of the county. So these are four sites that cover around about 1,500 hectares. And we offered uh, expertise from Finance Earth and Downforce Technologies to look at those sites in detail. And the... The, the, the funding mechanisms were things like carbon, were like uh, water company uh, credits, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But BNG came out on top because it's here and now. It would have been tomorrow, but now it's going to be January. Um, and effectively, each of those four sites, and two were privately owned and two were NGOs, basically are putting forward 438 hectares of land to be considered for BNG. So that's a substantial investment and the business cases are there and we, we've completed them ready to go. So it shows you it's a reality and those landowners are very serious about it. We in the County Council are also quite serious about BNG being a way to improve biodiversity across Essex. So we've invested in two sites. Uh, this is the first one on Mersey Island. It's a former arable site. We've actually just sown the uh, native meadow on the site. Uh, it's in Colchester Borough, and that's important because that's the local planning authority. Um, and we have a very schematic view here of what it's going to look like, but we're going to thicken up scrub areas. We're going to the green lines and new hedges going in, and that meadow is being designed uh, with um, yellow wagtail, turtle doves, um, uh, corn bunting in mind. But of course, you have a meadow, and it's all the invertebrates and the pollinators and the habitat that you're creating. So that, that's a very exciting proposal. Um, and it will be, uh, be grazed by uh, heritage cattle and will introduce uh, some sort of structural diversity by coppicing. The second site is one of our um, former landfill sites, a site in Tendering District, where we're looking at nine hectares of a bigger site, which when the ecologists assessed that site, they said, this isn't performing in a, in, for nature. We could do much more here. And actually we did all the assessments and we're going to uh, introduce a new uh, grazing, sorry, a new cutting regime. We're going to introduce coppicing in some of the scrub areas. And by doing so, we can uplift the biodiversity of this site. So a very exciting opportunity in those two sites. So we started to do the finances. Obviously, we had to, to bring on board our finance colleagues to say, you know, what is it you're doing? What are you suggesting? So we expect the, uh, the, the income to be around about two and a half million pounds for those two sites, which is about 16 hectares. Um, we need to spend about a quarter of a million uh, on the actual initial costs, um, but the overall costs over the 30 years are about one and a half million. So there's gonna be a surplus, we hope, of about a million pounds, which we seek to invest again in biodiversity net gain and other conservation work. Uh, so. You know, the, the figures are, are stacking up for this. Um, it's good that we've got a surplus because who knows what we'll need that for over 30 years. 30 years is a very long time, but uh, it, it looks pretty good at this point. Looking at other counties, uh, Oxfordshire have just done a study on BNG, um, come out in June of this year. They reckon that it would take about 800 million to produce uh, the 30% figure that we've often talked about, 30% nature areas. Um, and they, th they think that BNG will deliver at the 10% BNG uplift around about 10% of that 800 million figure. Um, if they went to 20%, it unfortunately doesn't mean 20% uplift, it means 13% because of kind of law of diminishing returns. And that actually, I think, um, is pretty optimistic. And I'll, I'll tell you why in a minute. 
We have done some similar work in Essex, but we looked at it from a different way. We know that there's going to be 100,000 dwellings uh, planned for Essex up to 2036. We estimated that around about, that would deliver 6,500 BNG units, um, which we valued at around about 168 million. Um, if you put into the uh, equation the two unitaries, because that was based on the 14 districts and boroughs and cities, it's around, so that's South End in, and uh, uh, Thurrock, it's around about 200 million, which yeah, is based on a lot of assumptions, I, I have to admit. But six units being a rough average uh, delivered off site, and bearing in mind that Arabo has a baseline of around two units, we're talking about four units per hectare. We think that's around about 2,000 hectares of new biodiverse land being created in Essex. So that equates to about 13 and a half um, Hyde Parks. To give that a bit of a historical perspective, that 2,000 hectares hasn't been created in Essex for a very long time. In the 1970s, when we had the uh, countryside legislation, our country parks are about 1,000 hectares. Uh, but actually, most of those were already designated land. Um, Weald Park, Thorndon Park, they were just designated as country parks. You have to go back to William the Conqueror uh, to get to a point where uh, 2,000 hectares of natural land was created, when Epping Forest, Hainault Forest, Hatfield Forest. That's the sort of... Uh, the, the, the transformational change that we're looking for. Now, what I'm saying at the very end is actually, it's only three and a half percent of our 30%. So am I gonna finish on a depressing note? No, I'm not, because that's substantial in itself because of the sheer area. But I wanted to finish to say BNG is not the only game in town. There are a heck of a lot of other games in town. And Tony's mentioned them all, so it feels like I'm repeating them slightly. But ELMS, the Environmental Land Management Scheme promoted by government, has countryside stewardship, which is already up and running, sustainable farming incentives to uh, get farmers to uh, farm sustainably, and landscape recovery scheme. And I'll just dwell a second on landscape recovery because this year two applications have gone in in Essex. One at the Stour and one a partnership between ourselves, the County Council, Essex Wildlife Trust, the RSPB, the National Trust and Essex and Suffolk Water Company. It covers 2,600 hectares of the Colne and Blackwater estuary. It's a huge area and it's one application. So you might say, well, we should be concentrating all our work on landscape recovery. What's this BNG about? But it's exactly what Tony was saying. It's about connectivity. BNG will fit into the local nature recovery strategy. It'll be the connecting places across all 14 districts and the two unitaries. It's actually the, the, the stepping stones for nature to be connected to the existing places that we already have. Landscape recovery is a different thing, and it's focusing on really important areas. And I would hope that landscape recovery starts to kind of take off every year. We have another scheme and another scheme, because there are so many areas of Essex that that could happen in. Carbon trading, again, Tony mentioned it. We've already got the Woodland Carbon Code, the Peatland Code. Salt Marsh Carbon Code is coming soon. Very important for Essex, having the second longest uh, coastline in, the, in England. Soil Carbon Code will be coming in other habitat codes now. This is really important because big corporates are interested in carbon. They're attracted to carbon. They need to offset their carbon. So the, the very final point is about corporate so, social responsibility. I think there's a win-win here. Corporates we know from RSPB and the Wildlife Trust are already contacting those NGOs and saying to them, we want to be part of the action. We want to be able to say we're doing good things for nature, but we also want to offset our carbon. So it's a win-win uh, opportunity. But we've got marine net gain, Natural flood management, we as a county council have been working on that for many years now. That is delivering uh, lots of green spaces. Archie's uh, second enclosure of 60 hectares was partly funded by flood management uh, uh, grants. So we're already doing those nature areas. So, so what I wanted to conclude is BNG is really important. It's not the only game in town, but it's, it's part of our armory and our toolbox to actually make a transformational change to the Essex landscapes. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, John and Rob. Um, it's really interesting biodiversity net gain, isn't it? Because um, um, I'm also Twin Hatton on Braintree District Council, and a few months ago, we actually had our first planning application through, and there was a biodiversity net gain uh, application in it. I bet you couldn't guess at what percentage that came in. Well, I'll tell you, it came in at 10.01%. 
So, you know, as what we've been talking about, there's lots of opportunities for 20%. Anyway, we're running uh, uh, on time, but uh, well, just a little bit late. But I, I really must ask you a, a couple of quick questions, if I may, with, with quick responses. I'm sure you're good at it. Um, uh, if BNG is not met, how will this be overseen, do you think? I think, Rob, you described that a bit earlier, didn't you? And yeah, so it will come down to the, the local planning authority um, as the decision maker on planning applications. And the developer would have to submit um, a biodiversity net gain plan, which would detail how they're going to achieve their 10% net gain. This would be, is expected to be secured as a planning condition. Yeah, so um, the other thing I wanted to say is that um, the end of November, of course, we're expecting guidance from government. And part of that is going to include details around enforcement um, which is expected to be linked through the planning system. So what I'm trying to say is it's the local planning authority that will be um, the sort of deciding body when it comes to delivering the 10%. Who funds that? So government have promised, well, they've given up to £16 million of, of new burdens funding towards local authorities. Um, and that has been to help with training needs and also bringing in relevant staff. But I think resourcing is, is a big question um, and one that, that is a challenge with delivering BNG. So, so just to say, the government has given all the Essex authorities uh, some BNG funding. And part of that has been to um, pull that together and have a BNG officer for Essex as well. So, you know, we've got, we've got that resource from now and um, the, the local districts and boroughs and unitaries have also got that resource to go forward with. Okay, thank you. And uh, this is, I think, an interesting question. BNG is described as long term, but and runs for thirty years, as we just heard. But what happens after that? Should we go? Okay. Yeah. So, obviously, these are going to be now biodiverse areas in thirty years' time. Um, they'll be evaluated and looked at, and then um, you know, at this moment in time, we 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 really can't be sure. But in thirty years' time, when we really are at the sharp end of the climate crisis. Um, I think the governments and the local governments at the time will look to hold on to these sites as absolutely precious. So we're kind of crystal ball gazing here, but having got a very um, metricated um, view of how this has improved, I can't see them saying, OK, you can go back to clearing the land and doing something else with it. Can I just come in on that one? Sure. Um, of course, 30 years is a very long time, um, but we, we are hearing that you can basically you can enter into BNG a second time. So if you can deliver additional enhancements on your land, then potentially there's a kind of another stage of funding beyond the 30 years. And I think also there was a consultation recently looking at sort of um, the tax implications for beyond that period. So there is some work ongoing around that. The other thing to say is, um, you know, if habitats develop as expected and they mature, then all of those policy and legal protections that I mentioned earlier, they would still apply. So I think, um, you know, it, it's a long time away, but beyond 30 years, there are likely to be some measures in place to incentivise retaining and, and enhancing those habitats. Um, OK, I think we better make this just the very last question, but um, I'm interested in the response to this, uh, especially from a planning aspect. It says here, targets higher than 10% can be set, but need to be backed up by evidence, as you mentioned. Um, how? And developers will usually default to a baseline minimum, mid-tier. Mid-tier planning authorities may not have current LDPs um, or biodiversity data, so will in part be reliant on the developer's own due diligence or greenwashing, asp um, greenwashing ambition. Should we take this first? Yeah. Um, can you hear me a bit better, better now? Okay. So the legislation does allow um, for local authorities to consider higher targets above the mandatory minimum. I think this is where local policy comes in as a really important mechanism for looking at that. Now, as I said, it, it needs to be robust and it needs to be evidence to avoid challenge. But we know that across the country, other authorities are looking at this. Guildford is an example that have actually adopted 20% in policy. Um, and there's been a lot of work in Kent looking at viability assessments. And we know that the Essex Local Nature Partnership is also um, setting a real ambition to look at those higher targets. So, so there, is, there is kind of evidence forming. It's, a, you know, it's still quite an early picture, but I think there are other authorities across the country that can be looked at um, so we don't reinvent the wheel, essentially. And I'd add uh, Thurrock are considering 20% as well uh, at the moment. But the, 
what I think the, uh, the, the evidence he's referring to is, is viability studies. And actually, um, to be able to show that this is kind of not massively decreased the amount of development in Essex. And the studies, the early studies from elsewhere are showing that the increase from 10% to 20% is actually very small because you're spreading that cost over 30 years. So it, it, it isn't restrictive in most of those viability studies because those, those have been already done elsewhere. So it's actually um, really important. And I know that Simon and other partners are looking into that evidence base for, for Essex as well. OK, thank you. I think we better um, uh, pause there and ready for the next. So thank you both very much for that. Um, I particularly found that really interesting, especially with my sort of um, planning from Brainshire District Council hat. But I'm sure you all found that really interesting, too, because everybody's talking about biodiversity net gain and we're wanting to know the facts. So I hope, um, Sue, John and uh, Rob, that you've, you've had a good indication of what is changing. And there are some very good practical examples of actually what's going on in Essex. And this is what it's all about. It's ga gaining that experience as well and what is actually happening in Essex. So both, thank you very much. It was great. Thank you. For the next 20, 25 minutes, um, there's an opportunity here to uh, ask further questions to Lord Deven and Tony Juniper. Um, we're all just going to quickly um, either just stand around here and chat or go on stage. So um, if they come up on Slido, uh, I'll ask the question. So I'd like both Tony um, and Lord Deven to join me on stage. What I was really interested in, um, where you mentioned about breaking down uh, not only the silos, but working together and the collaboration and how important that is going to um, be. Do you think that the uh, government targets, as have been set by 2050, um, are realistically enough to alter the amount of um, change that we need to get to net zero? And would there be a huge advantage in accelerating that by a few years? Because uh, you talk about the economy of um, green skills, green infrastructure and everything else and the benefits that that would have to the economy from a work point of view. And I just wondered what your thoughts were on that. So Lord Deben's probably better set to ask some of those questions around the trajectory to 2050, having recently been the chair of the Climate Change Committee. But what I would say um, is that if you look at the climate science and the implications of what it says, uh, it is the early action which gives us the biggest benefits. And so um, it leads me to reach the conclusion that all the emphasis on 2050, it's fine. We do have to be net zero by then, uh, preferably quite a lot earlier. But it's the emissions in 2023 and 2024 and 2025 that are far more important than the emissions in 2050, because what we have to do is limit the amount that's emitted in total. And the more we do now, the more difficult it becomes later on. And so, you know, the idea that we can kick the can down the road to the 2040s and, you know, carry on as we were until December 2049, which is the impression that some people get when they hear the way this is talked about, is completely wrong. Uh, so early action uh, is what we must focus on. And I, you know, I, I, I don't know the details in terms of the policy mix, but John's been much closer to that. Um, at the Climate Change Committee, so they may have some remarks there. Um, I mean, the way I look at it, you know, we've, we've done OK on renewables up to a point. We've been struggling on transport, land use. We've made a bit of progress. Uh, heating is like a huge, big issue. And on all of it, we, we need to be going faster, it seems to me. Yeah, especially on uh, retrofit as well. Lord Eben. Well, yes, I mean, I think that um, uh, the Climate Change Committee made it very clear that uh, when the government produced its, uh, whatever it was, 3,000 pages of uh, explanation of how it was going to get to net zero, which it had to do because of the court case in which it was taken to court by Client Earth and Friends of the Earth and others, to, uh, on, on the basis that it was not clear, that it didn't have a programme to reach net zero, and the law said they had to. And the uh, court uh, insisted that they produced a much more detailed thing, which they did. Um, but of course, they didn't give it to the Climate Change Committee until the morning, the evening of the, before the morning they published it. So 
um, for the very first time. It was quite clear we were rather suspicious of this, so we spent some time looking at every single detail, and the result was that we were less sure that they were going to reach it than we had been before they produced the document, because there were various things that you could give them the benefit of the doubt for, which we know didn't have any doubt. They were not going to achieve it. So they're back in the courts, and I don't think that the Prime Minister quite understood that uh, the courts will make a judgment based not on his vague assertions that we'll get to net zero, but on the detailed statements that the Climate Change Committee has done. The Climate Change Committee is entirely independent. It's only, apart from its chairman, who uh, isn't a scientist, or why wasn't a scientist, we haven't got a new chairman, they haven't even found a new chairman yet, but, but uh, everyone else was a really serious scientist or economist, uh, eight or nine of us. And, and the result uh, is that uh, I think that the courts will be faced with a situation where the government is saying one thing, but it is not proving it. And so uh, the real issue in any case is exactly what Tony says. The more you do early on, the more effective it is. If you don't do it early on, then actually the effect is much greater. And so we're going to have more and more of what we've had in the last few days. I mean, if they, I cannot understand why they don't understand that, because it's so obvious that it's not getting better. And of course, for governments, it's very serious. It's why I'm very optimistic is really because it's so awful. And I'll explain why that is. It's going to get worse every year. And therefore, every year, more and more people are going to say, why the bloody hell haven't you done something about it? And I think that's exactly what's going to happen, which is why the government's decisions are so short-sighted, because we won't forget. We won't forget that they didn't do what they promised they'd do. They held on to the, to, to the targets without providing the means. And it's... In the end, it's delivery that matters. We know that in our businesses. See, you can have any scheme, you can tell the shareholders anything you like, but in the end, the shareholders will look and say, how did you deliver? How are you going to deliver? It's no good promising all this. We want to know the delivery programme, and the government has not got an effective delivery programme, and DEFRA hasn't got one at all. If you can imagine anything, one of the two... Um, uh, departments most responsible for uh, climate change, DEFRA, doesn't have a programme to reach net zero by 2050. And, and, and in those circumstances, one is gobsnapped. I'm told privately they do, but they don't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you. Um, I'll just take the next question that's come up here. Uh, when engaging with water companies, they, they counter with, we are doing what is required of us by government. And then, uh, the question is, how do we get past that? I think it's quite a good question. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, the, the water companies, uh, I mean, there's a huge amount of complexity, isn't there? Uh, I think, well, th there's, a, there's a couple of major things that are important. And one is if you look back to 20... 10, 11, 12, and I was doing this the other day for a piece of research, and look at the debate that was going on between the main political parties, and they basically were having a bidding war about how cheap they could make water. Yeah. And um, it was, uh, you know, one politician, well, we can make it cheaper than you, no, we can make it cheaper than you. And the water companies work to this price review process. Every five years, they go to off what, the water regulator, where they put in their plans for new sewage works, uh, new mains, cleaning up uh, rivers, plugging leaks, new reservoirs, and all of that stuff. It costs a lot of money, obviously, if you do it to the standard that we need. And so in that kind of pushing the price down, more than a decade ago, basically, we took a lot of stuff out of the plans that we now look back in hindsight and we thought actually it might have been quite a good idea to upgrade that sewage works after all if you look at what's going on now <laughs> and uh, never mind the reservoirs and everything else 
Uh, so to some extent, they've got a point in so far as like, you know, they were told not to invest. I went to a water treatment works owned by Thames Water a few years ago, and they said that the way that the economics had been done in terms of what they were permitted to invest to upgrade it in terms of what they would then be asking the customer to pay on their bills, the margin was so slender that they would have to keep that water treatment work running for 1,000 years, they said, in order to be able to meet the demands being placed on the company economically by the economic regulator, just to put it into perspective. So there's that side of it. On the other side of it, of course, you have a series of privatised utilities which are invested in by private investors who need a return. And, you know, a kind of countervailing force, as it were, in terms of where the revenues go. Do they go into fully recycled into rebuilding the infrastructure or is some of it going out to reward shareholders for putting their money in? And there's a lot of complexity in all of that. Um, and it requires quite a lot of untangling. Um, but whether we have the right kind of model to do what we now need to do for nature recovery, I mean, a lot of people are thinking about it. Um, I probably shouldn't share any views uh, on the grounds that the Sunday Telegraph will probably report them again this weekend, and um, it's becoming far too regular. Uh, so, Well, I don't know whether the Sunday Telegraph is here, but it is worth just remembering the history. The history was that, because um, I was a minister at the time, I was uh, a minister of state and agriculture at the time, um, Mrs Thatcher had no intention of uh, privatising the water industry. What happened was we joined the European Union, discovered that our water was in a disgraceful state. I mean, everybody talked as if we were right at the top. We were right at the bottom. I'm like, I, I think Greece wasn't as good, but in general, we were right at the bottom. So she realised that what had happened over many, many years was that water was run by... Uh, a nationalised system and local government, and they'd never put the money into it because every time the nationalised system asked for money, the Chancellor of the Exchequer said, I haven't got any money this year, might do it next year, I haven't done it this year. So if you remember surfers against sewage, for example, all the way round the coast, I mean, we were in a terrible state. So um, she could see no other, and I think it's true, there was no other way of getting the money into it. So they privatised it. And the money did come into it. That's exactly what happened. But of course, they had to ask the price of doing it because that was necessary. They could get money in at a very low interest rate because it was very safe. But of course, it, however low the interest rate, in the end, it has to be paid back. And so they then told off what the government told off. Well, we can't have these prices going up like this. And I, by this time, had become Minister of Agriculture. And I was faced with this situation that we had terrible water. We were forced. We were having people in, in down in the southwest, for example, where the water companies had been particularly bad. They were local authorities had just poured the sewage into the sea and and it was really bad but the cost of putting it right was huge so we then did what we could and and fiddled about with it and then after that time as as you say pr precisely in the early uh 2010s uh, uh, about that time both major political parties, not unhelped uh, by the Liberal Party because they didn't stand up about it, and all the three men were kept on talking about the cost of water. Now, I want to say water ought to be more expensive because it is very expensive. But I remember having to stand up in the House of Commons um, being b absolutely belayed by my Labour opponent because I said all water should be, uh, should, should be um, uh, 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 metered. And I got all this about what happens to a bus driver with six children um, uh, if it's metered. And I said, it's very simple. You, you, you have a low level for the necessities of life, and then you make it very much more expensive for the person who's using potable water for their swimming pool. And it seems to me that it's very simple. I'm rather vulgar about this. You look after the poorest and then you charge people a proper charge. Then you can do something about the sewage. 
we had to wait until the sewage was so bad that the public noticed. And then we only got it through because the Duke of, <laughs> the Duke of Wellington led us rebels. <laughs> yeah. We led us rebels against the government. And I've, I must tell you this because it's so funny, I've never enjoyed it so much as every now and again, the horny-handed hands of soil, horny-handed gentlemen from the benches opposite were saying, oh, his grace has been so good about this. We're entirely in favour of the Duke of Wellington. And we got it through and we forced it through. And then when they tried to reverse it in the House of Commons, of course, there was a real revolt by the public who said, you can't vote against doing something about the sewage which is why I remind you about doing what you have to do about um, going to your Member of Parliament on the subject of climate change. It's only when they do understand that it matters that they make a difference. Yeah, yeah. yeah thank you. Um, this next question is uh, interesting, and I'm sure you've got some uh, interesting views on this. It says, what are your top three Pacific detailed policies you'd like to see in party manifestos ahead of the next election. I think, Lord Deben, I'd better go to you first on that, because I'm sure you've got to think of some. Well, first of all, we need to have a proper programme for enabling people to move to cleaner ways of heating their homes. That seems to me to be quite clear. We need to put some more money into what the government has got right, actually, the money it's put into local authorities for the poorest, only we could put some more into that. But we've got to have a system whereby people can borrow the money for the changes they want to make in their house, in their homes, um, over a long period of time. And you could borrow it at very low rates because the, fi the finance is there as long as the government stands behind it and as long as there is a system to tie it to the house. Because otherwise, if I borrow it and then I move, then I can be chased for the money. You can't do that. You have to have a sort of second mortgage system. And at that rate, you would find it would be very low interest rates comparatively. And the savings that you would make in terms of, uh, of energy really makes that worthwhile. So that would, be, that would be my number one. My number two would be immediately to put in much tougher um, uh, much tougher uh, building regulations so that every house that was built from now on will be fit for the future instead of not being fit for the future. And every house and every commercial building would have to have photovoltaic cells automatically on the roof as part of what they do. It would not be more expensive because the price would come out of the cost of land. What would happen would be that the builders would do what they always do. They charge the maximum they can. They work it all the way back. And that's what the price of land is. And you just lower the price of land to some extent. I would add to that a windfall tax on house builders. Anybody who built more than 100 houses uh, before, a windfall tax over the next five years to put in a a box of money which anybody who bought any of their houses would be able to claim in order to retrofit the houses that they have improperly. So that's the second thing. And the third thing is I would bring in a series of my special taxes, including the one on uh, uh, pr private plane flying. We've really got to make people pay the cost and the richest people cost the earth more proportionately, and they should pay for it. And if they don't like it, there's an answer. You don't fly privately, and that helps the environment. So I'm all in favour of that tax failing, because so few people actually fly privately. Yeah, very good. Well, thank you. I think those policies are obviously well supported yeah. in the room. So Tony, yeah. what do you think? Well, I'd vote for all three of those. Um, uh, assuming we're going to have a long manifesto, here's three more. Um, so I, I would have a sustainable food strategy put into the manifesto because what we've got at the moment are a series of conversations going on, one about food poverty and cost of living, one about global trade and access to markets, another one about biodiversity, uh, one more about climate change emissions, another one about um, land use and how much land we've got to spare for 
renewables and everything else. And also public health, of course, and some of the health challenges we're leaning into. They're all different faces of a failing food system in some way or other. And what we don't have is a strategy that reflects all of that. We have policies that come and touch different bits of it. And there was a very important piece of work done a couple of years ago by a chap called Henry Dimbleby, um, who wrote a, a, a national food strategy. And he turned it into a book called Ravenous, which is a good read, uh, whereby he really went into the data. It, it's not an opinion piece. It's, well, it's, it, it does reflect opinions. But he got all of the data on all of these different subjects and put them together and came forward with an idea for a national food strategy that kind of got shelved. It got put onto a shelf. Uh, so whoever wanted to, uh, all the political parties could put that in their manifesto and say uh, that we should have a national food strategy, um, because that would be a key to unlocking a lot of health, climate, biodiversity and food security outcomes all at once. If we can get our arms around it as a system rather than a series of apparently disconnected issues. So that's number one. Number two, I would have some policies that make it very clear that there are some positive synergies between environmental action and dealing with the cost of living. And so John's mentioned two policies, which I think would be part of that. So the water one, block rising tariffs. For basic use, filling up your kettle, water's basically free. If you're filling a swimming pool, you start to pay quite big money. I mean, that's a simple signal uh, that also plays into this piece about sustainable resource use. You know, we can't all live like billionaires. If there simply isn't enough planet to do that, even if we did all want to be billionaires, we're going to have to push down the environmental impact per capita. And if we can show ways of doing that at the same time as promoting good outcomes for the cost of living, then uh, that would be all the better. Um, what else could you do on that? Home energy efficiency, of course, would be another one uh, where, you know, we had a campaign at Friends of the Earth back in the 90s called the Warm Homes Campaign. Um, which set out to get everyone who was living in fuel poverty properly insulated so that their homes weren't wasting heat. So had we done that, um, uh, when was this? This was 99, actually. Yeah, so it was in, in that period. Um, had we done that then, and had we succeeded in delivering the 15-year program on home energy efficiency, which actually was legislated for, we did win a parliamentary campaign through a private member's route that said, in 15 years, there'll be no more fuel poverty. And then subsequent to that, there were various kind of maneuverings and changing of definitions to the point where it was never really acted upon. But had it been acted upon, what would have been the consequence of that at the time of the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the hike in gas prices? It would have had a transformative effect, I think, in terms of the poorest people who can't afford to heat their homes. They would have been protected by a policy that was enacted 20 years before. We never did it, but we now know, shouldn't we, we should do this. Cost of living environment, two sides of the same coin. Let's have a policy manifesto piece for that. And then the third thing I would have, given some of the remarks I made earlier about this false kind of economic narrative that's taken hold, where GDP growth trumps everything else, I would say in the manifesto that what we need to have is a new indicator of economic progress, which is measuring more than simply the amount of stuff and transactions uh, being sold in the economy, which is basically what GDP, GDP is doing. So alongside business transactions and consumption, should we have a measure of happiness, of social cohesion, of longevity, of overall public health? Because if you put all of those things together, you might start doing some different policies compared to just focusing on one element which is GDP. So that's what I'd do. Thank you very much. Uh, this is, that session of uh, Q&A just passed so quickly, and we need to move yes. on. Great. So um, thank you very much, uh, Lord Deven and Tony, not only thank for you. your, your s speeches today and your thoughts, but also for your knowledge and experience and all the action that's going um, on here in Essex. I hope you found that interesting as well. Very but, much, thank but thank you very much for that. So now we're going to move on to the next section. But I'd now like just to ask Simon, Simon Lister, um, to actually just come up and, and give us a call to wrap things up and just this sort of overview of what he's thought that. Because as, as I said in my introduction to Simon, he, he's Essex born and bred as well. Um, and you, can, you know of what they've talked about today with the panel and everything else. So I've just asked Simon just to give his view, give us a wrap up uh, before we finish for the day. So Simon. 
Being an Essex man, when I was told that Kevin is, is sort of indisposed, I thought, you know, I'm an opportunist. I'm going to take advantage of this. So what I wanted to do just briefly was just reflect on some of the things that we've, we've heard. Um, but also, what does that take us? What, what's the next steps? Um, and I think we've heard everything today. You know, we've had the, the next uh, manifesto, the next general election written. Um, we've... Um, we had some fantastic presentations from Lord Deeb and Antony, you know, about some of these big issues that, that are facing us all. And I suppose some of the, the sort of take home bits for me for, for, for that um, was that A, this, this link between climate and nature. I mean, here we're, we're here today to talk primarily about nature recovery, but dealing you know, with nature recovery and getting to net zero really are uh, two sides of, of the same coin. Um, so there's a strong link between the two. And I think that the, the, the fact that the here and now piece, you know, waiting, we've just been talking about it, just waiting till 2049, you know, that's no good at all. We've absolutely got to start now. And I love Tony sort of um, talking about Churchill, um, you know, saying this is not the time for procrastination because, you know, the storm clouds of war are gathering. Well, now it's real storm clouds that are gathering. And absolutely, it is not the time for procrastination. It, it is the time for putting it all aside and say, we've got to do this. We've got to tackle climate change. We've got to tackle nature recovery. Uh, there is no other choice. We absolutely have to get on with it. But then another key message that was coming through today, and uh, Emma made this, was, was partnership. And you know, we need to all work together about, uh, on this. And one of the things that I think Churchill was probably quite clever about was that not only did he say, now is the not time to procrastination, we've got to stand up to Nazism, he got the whole country behind him and he got everybody behind him. And that's what we've got to do in this battle. It's, it's not about creating divisions. It's about all of us working to, uh, to, together on that. And that, uh, I think, has come through uh, strongly today and is absolutely something that we should keep with us. And I think that we were also told, I can't remember by who, you know, be brave. You know, just now is not the well, part of the procrastination point. You know, don't show weakness. Just let's do it. Let's be ambitious. Um, and for me, and, and, and probably the most important point for more, anyway, for me, is that I think we can do this. I think we absolutely can do it. I think we can achieve nature recovery. We heard that it's already started. I think that we, we, we can get to net zero and we can meet human needs. I mean, we can produce food. We can produce water. We can provide housing and it can be done. So many people who would say and try and divide, oh, you're either got to be in favor of nature recovery or you've got to be in favor of human, you know, hum meeting human needs. It's a nonsense. The two, it's not a conflict. It is both and. It's not either the or. And I think that we absolutely need to, to, to remember that. So what are we going to do next? Uh, oh, there is a slide there. I was wondering if it might, might, might be there. Um, is, is, I think we can do it. So let's get on with it. Let's, let's do it. Let's get more Emmas working and having farm clusters throughout the, 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 the county. Let's get more Archies who's gone. Let's get more Joes who, who are doing things in terms of introducing people to, to nature. And as I think maybe the second slide hopefully will show, um, that you've had a, a fair amount of, you've heard about this local nature recovery strategy. Well, as has been said, we're busy working on it as a local nature partnership. We're still sort of coming up trying to with the best first draft we can. But in about three weeks, I think it starts on the 21st of November. Oh no, there's one on the 10th of November. We've got a whole lot of workshops coming up in which you can engage with the local nature recovery strategy. And we really do want to get as much input and comment as we possibly can, because when we come to the final nature, local nature recovery strategy, um, which will be next summer, we want it to be an ambitious, practical, deliverable strategy that has everybody's support. So please engage in this local nature recovery strategy pr process. Uh, as, as, as has been mentioned before, one of the key things coming out of it is going to be these opportunity maps as to where we focus 
uh, on terms of nature recovery. And we need support and input as to what those maps should show and where should they be. So please engage. There are going to be these, 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 these workshops, but that's just the start of the process. Uh, then we will be going out to public consultation. Um, and that, that will mostly start earlier in, in the new year. And by then, we'll have a draft that we can then make available to people so they can see what we're thinking about. But we'll make it very clear that you know, this is not the end of it. We want people's input into it. So, so please do that. Um, I would also, I'm mean, sorry to bang on about this, but you know, if you are from a, from a district, I mean, do please consider requiring more than the statutory minimum of 10% BNG. Um, you know, do, do please consider uh, going for a higher percentage. And Rob quite rightly mentioned that there's a, you know, there's a bunch of sort of hurdles, tests that need to, need to, be, to be gone through. Um, and as a local nature partnership, we are thinking of putting together some, some work, doing some reports that will be there to help those of you um, who are thinking of going for 10% and uh, for more than 10%. Um, and I won't go into the detail of all that now, but if as a local authority, you are considering it and you would like some help in terms of how do you get over those, those hurdles and tests that need to be done, come and talk to us because we will happily work with you to help you get over those tests and get some of the work done that needs to be done so, so, so that you can survive any challenges in court. But I would urge you to be, think about it seriously because you know, as Rob said, Guildford's already done it. A load of other local authorities, planning authorities are thinking about it. And it would make a huge difference to nature if, if, if you can do it. And it will not, um, and this is what the, the work will show, add, add significantly to the cost. It, 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 it just won't happen. And, um, and on BNG and why, again, that's so important that John's excellent presentation, looking at the difference that would be made, I think you showed about a 3% difference towards our target. And I think, John, if I understood it correctly, that was looking at housing development. Because the other significant court of, of source of, of BNG is going to be these nationally significant infrastructure projects. And I think there's something like 12 or 13 uh, NSIPs, as they're known, that are currently in the pipeline, which will add significantly to that percentage. So if we can get LPAs to require 20%, it would be really, really helpful. And the, my final message to all of you would be, a, thank you so much for coming and letting us bang on about these subjects. But B, think about what each of you can do. All of you will be in a position where you can do something. And, and, and you know, just think about what you can do and do it. And because we're Essex and because we are the best and we're not remotely competitive, but we're going to do this better than anybody else. And then we're going to have other counties follow us. So thank you very much. Yeah, great words. And I think, you know, uh, we can all make a difference and it doesn't matter how small or large it is. It's an action that we can help in Essex. Um, well, we've come to the end of our summit this morning. So uh, thank you very much all for coming, uh, you know, and taking the time out and coming to listen to not only our fantastic speakers that we've had today, and I mean all of them, because you've just heard from the length and breadth of their experience and knowledge. Um, that has been so important and, the, and it shows also the amount of people that are involved in what we're all trying to do across Essex together here. And that's becoming more and more important. And of course, you know, with our diversity and our pushing towards net zero, this is becoming more and more important all of the time. And we know that because a lot of the uh, resident surveys that we do, environment and net zero and climate is in the top four of our responses on a constant basis. So I hope you've had a really interesting and informative morning. And I'm, I'm sure that you will go away uh, inspired from all that's gone on this morning. And I think your questions uh, through Slido, which is the first use and technically, I think that's worked very well. So thank you very much for our technically for all the people working behind the scenes, our officers, uh, our cameras um, and our comms teams and especially to Louise Tenekoon as well, because it takes an awful lot of effort and time in arranging and getting these meetings together, getting the places or the people to speak. Um, it takes a lot of work, I can tell you, and there's been a few drafts going through over time, but we're here and I think you'll agree it's been a great morning. Um, a couple of other things is uh, we would really value your feedback um, on the Slido before you go, and I believe the link's on your screen if you've got it on your phones now. 
Um, and just for your information, please finally save the date because our next climate summit um, is going to take a deep dive into water. And obviously, as we've heard already from our speakers and what they've been talking about, our extremes of weather and the fact that we are in Essex, which is one of the driest counties, um, are, is going to take place on March the 20th of 24. So that's next March on the 20th. And obviously, we'll be in touch and let you know. Um, so also, would you just return your badges as well when you go on the way up, please? Because um, part of the circular economy and keeping all of that, that's really important for us. A couple of other things. You have heard, and we've had a deep dive really today on this summit, all about restoring nature and the importance of value of nature to us all. And I think that's what's come through as a very strong message. It's not only the importance of nature, but the value of it. And that value is often unseen. And OK, BNG is now beginning to get a, a value. But um, I think nature, as we all know, especially post-COVID, the open spaces, the green spaces, as we heard, that it just, as Joe mentioned, that actually just when you're walking in it, it helps to make you feel better as well. And that's really important. So what else are we doing? So um, I'd just like to mention to you about our car Carbon Cutting Essex app, which we launched in May of this year. Um, and this is basically tailored to Essex. But if any of you are not in Essex, you can also register to use it. So please download it. And we have monthly themes on it. Um, and you can easily get it. And it's free of charge from Google or Apple as well. And we're finding that we're getting quite a few downloads on that. But the, the point about it is, is it's an app that's on with everybody of all the time. And it's not only for residents, but businesses as well. And we feel that we are leading the field in this by having an Essex app for carbon cutting, encouraging you every day to make small changes, big state changes as well. And also what's really good about it is there's a small reward scheme. And it's not necessarily um, what you think it is, but it can also add in points in that. And what's good about it is you can gift some of it where, as, you, as you go through it um, and you work with it you're able to give some of the uh, financial benefits or grants and help local schools and education as well. So th there is a good reason um, for downloading that as well. But as I say, it's evolving very quickly. It has monthly th themes that go on it. So that is there for anybody as well. Also, if you're interested and if you're not already, um, we, have a climate, um, we have a climate action monthly newsletter. Um, if you're not on it, do see Emma here, who's going to wave her hand afterwards um, and she'll sign you up for it as well and because our last edition is really good and we're, it just lists all the action that we're taking across Essex so if you're at all interested I would recommend that as well um, and also this deep dive this morning of course at Essex County Council and more importantly not just Essex County Council but if you want to google um, and find out about what we are doing across Essex or actually what Essex is doing it's fantastic. Um, and you can easily find out a lot more information on that um, for our, um, our Climate Action Annual Plan. Uh, we're now producing our second one this year, but that is available. So if you just Google that, that will take you straight to the front page and that will give you a wide, uh, but quite a comprehensive overview of everything that we are doing in Essex. And you can see the action that we have done and that will not just Essex County Council, as I say, but everything from all the organisations that you've heard today and everything that's enabling us towards the sustainability and net zero as a target across Essex. So thank you once again. I hope you've enjoyed that thing. And thank you again to all of the speakers and everybody involved. I hope you've taken a lot out of that. Um, oh, yes. And we're also, um, we've got two current waste strategies. Um, Bob Massey is, um, just remind me, a colleague. Uh, that is open on the public domain at the moment. Um, and that strategy is available to comment on as well. Um, so that runs to the 22nd of November. So if, you can, if you'd like to comment on that, we welcome it. We've got a lot of comments already, but it's all about getting as many responses. And we want to listen to everybody about it because it's going to help form our next waste strategy for the next 30 years. So thank you very much, everyone. I think it's been a great event. I have uh, really enjoyed myself this morning, and I hope you have. Um, and I look forward to hearing you uh, or hearing from you uh, with regards to the feedback, please. And thanks to, to everybody involved, and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.